Good morning. Welcome in to Herd at Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha and ESPN Tri-Cities. I'm Ravi Lula, Andrew Rogers. Uh, not here with me, but on the show with me this morning. Uh, we <clears throat> have to give a shout out to our fearless leader, Sasha, for braving it in so we could be on the air this morning. Andrew and I were not ma- able to make it into the the uh, Herd at Sports Bar and Grill, as you could probably see by our different backgrounds here this morning. But uh, we've got a show for you anyway. So we are, uh, we've got you jam packed here on a Friday. Uh, plenty of coaching stuff to catch up on from yesterday because apparently all the coaches decided to quit on the same day. Uh, we also have uh, some really good guests for you this morning. Coming up at 745, we will talk to Adam McClintock, the college football professor, uh, the founder, co-founder of Matrix Analytical. He is kind of the coaching metrics guru. Uh, so with all this going on, we had to get him on. And coming up at 8 o'clock, we've got Nick Ba. May have heard of him, college basketball analyst for FS1, host of the Nick Bob podcast, and of course, the Chicken Nick Show. Coming up at 8.45, we've got Vinny Iyer from Sporting News. He's an NFL writer. We'll talk about Belichick. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about Pete Carroll. We'll talk about all uh, the playoff uh, implications coming up this weekend as well. And then, of course, our Friday regulars, Mike Sauter from Herd at Sports at 9, and then wrapping up the week and the show with Matt Verzel at 9.45. But before we get any further, let's let's cross our fingers, see if I can hear my guy. Andrew, how you doing this morning? All right, I don't have you, Andrew. I got nothing. I'm just kidding. I'm oh. just mouthing. Oh. <laughs> I, had, I had to play with you a little bit. Okay. I'm just playing. I know I Sasha was probably is. panicking, though. She was definitely panicking when she saw that uh, all you could see were my lips. No, this isn't the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill, though. This would be Anthony Rezac, if it were. Uh, instead, it's just a nice painting that looks like it's been picked up from Hobby Lobby by the fiancé. Uh, but that's about <laughs> it. I, I can't really tell you where I was going to say, from. that is not Anthony Rezac. <laughs> Definitely not. But uh, you know what? Maybe it shows a little bit of what Anthony Rezac's all about. Underestimated. Uh, you know, the, it not a, people don't think he has a lot of color, but if you stare at it long enough, you're like, wow, that's probably like a really expensive <laughs> piece of art. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good day. It's a weird day. I'd rather be in studio sitting next to you, my guy, but, uh, you know, we make do with what we have and we got a great show going. So, um, excited for that, but yes, you're right. Tasha is an absolute animal. Can't give her enough credit for making the trek this morning. We call her our fearless leader and it's kind of like, just like a figure of speech, but like today she was actually fearless. Yeah, no, actually true this morning. So we definitely appreciate Sasha. As you can see, I don't know if you can tell, I got a little, see if I can point to it. That's that's Pedro Martinez right there in that frame in the background. That's my guy. Hey, that was well done. I I can't ever figure out like the direction. It took me a minute. You can see, I was like, it's like trying to, it's like trying to. It's like trying to wipe your butt with your left hand. You're like, what's happening here? (laughs) Um. (laughs) And I know the feeling because everybody's done it at least once. Dude, so I had uh, had shoulder surgery when I was in high school on my right arm. And so for like two months, I had to go lefty. And I got to tell you, it doesn't get any easier. Maybe I'm just not coordinated, but it was a full eight weeks of like, oh, come on. Uh, I should have just bought a bidet at that point. So you told me too, like hand surgery is upcoming. Is that on your right or left? Well, so it's the right first, and then they're doing the left, like I don't know, six weeks later or something. But oh man, I feel bad for you. Stupid, but like I got trigger fingers. I can't like bend my fingers. I well, normally people pull the trigger with their pointer finger. Not well, their yeah, it's you know, I got a middle on this one. I got a ring finger on this one. This is great radio if you're not watching on the stream. But uh, we we do have a jam packed show for you here today on a Friday. Hope everybody is safe and warm in their houses and that they didn't have to go anywhere this morning uh, like Sasha did. But we have we've got some Nebraska news. They landed linebacker Stefan Thompson. Kind of the last piece of that transfer visiting class that we'd been waiting on. Uh, during the show yesterday, we got the word on Jamal Banks being in. Stephon Thompson, the former Syracuse linebacker, so he's got a history with Tony White. He is in as well. Um, 
one of the only areas on the defense that I think people were kind of like, uh, might be able to use a little depth here. Yeah, a little concerned about. And the, getting this uh, transfer in Stephon Thompson, I think, eases some of those concerns. Obviously, getting uh, Bullock back for an extra year was a big help in that spot as well. But um, this, I mean, this Nebraska staff seems to be on a roll lately. Every time we turn around, it seems like they're getting another impact player, whether it's going all the way back to the high school recruiting season or in the transfer portal. Um, you know, we say it all the time, off-season champions, but Coach Rule and company are kind of killing it. It feels like this season is, is just different. One, because uh, of Dylan Rayola. I mean, Dylan, and, yeah. And uh, and getting the quarterback of your future. Uh, but two, you're absolutely right. And I, I think they do a nice job of balancing uh, what they – uh, kind of have set forth for the program with knowing the area of needs and going to the portal for that experience. Like they don't go too far into the portal where it's kind of like, okay, now we have too much to kind of decide from. They go into the portal enough to fill the need, but then understand that, okay, if we hit our cap, which mm -hmm. it seems like they're getting close to that, when they hit that cap, it's like, now our developmental guys are going to be the ones that fill the rest of this roster up. I, I just think they do a great job of figuring out exactly what they need, but they don't overdo it. They aren't doing things like what Deion Sanders has done in Colorado, where it's like, no, I got to get everybody and their mother in the portal. Mm -hmm. No, it's no, I'm going to go to the portal and fill my need, figure out who's the right fit for this program while also mixing them in to who we are already have in the room. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly targeted, right? They're incredibly precise about where they go after, what they're targeting. You know, it's, uh, I'm not a big, like, you know, hunting gun guy, but it's like, it's like a sniper versus a shotgun, right? Shotgun, you kind of get the spray, you get the blast. That's kind of what Dion does, and he's just is sort of hoping he hits something. We saw it with Mel Tucker up at Michigan State as well. And sometimes you do hit something, right? Like Mel Tucker... Got Kenneth Walker. He had that really good second season uh, where they ended up having a, a ton of success and sort of out of nowhere, right? But it's because they hit on a bunch of those portal guys with that widespread effort. This is much more targeted, much more precise. And listen, I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but this is what Coach Rule said he was about. And then he's shown that and executed that to perfection. Really, the only piece left that I would look at and say, hey, I think this is where they need a little help, and we've talked about this, is backup quarterback. And when you're talking about mm -hmm. a backup spot, you're in pretty good shape. I mean, they got an extra offensive lineman, which I didn't even think they necessarily needed, but obviously that's helpful always, right? Like, offensive and defensive lineman, you will always take, no matter what your situation looks like, right? Like, yes, we will take more offensive and defensive linemen. But outside of... That one, they've been really specific about their areas of need. They've been really specific about who they went after. And if they get a backup quarterback after the spring period, like, I mean, that's, that's you know, 10 out of 10, no notes. Like, I, I don't have any complaints or been like, oh, I wish they would have got this guy or maybe that guy. I mean, I guess you could say maybe you would have liked to see one more linebacker out of the group. But for the most part, they've really nailed it in terms of how they've approached this offseason. And there's a lot of good quarterbacks still in the transfer portal that would yeah. make a great backup. I, I mean, you you saw Clifton McDowell a, a enter the portal recently. He's the Montana quarterback, made it all the way to the FCS national title game. Of course, went up against the juggernaut known as SDSU, and Montana Oof. just fell short. It's too but much. he's yeah, he's somebody to keep an eye on. And I know there's been a little bit of smoke out there. I don't know how dark that smoke actually is, but there's been a little bit. You also have my guy, Matthew Sluke, I believe, still available still out there. in the Last portal. I saw, yeah. Um, and your guy, James Madison's quarterback, still available right yeah. now. So there's just there's a lot of names out there that you can mix in to where you're comfortable if Dylan's not ready yet, that these guys can step up for the first few games and, and really um, – kind of like get get Nebraska's season off to a good start. But if Dylan is ready, which we all hope he is, mm -hmm. these guys or whoever the guy is needs to be okay with coming over at, say, it's their senior season or it's their junior season. They have to be okay with competition, not just riding the pine, 
but competition and 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 working with a younger quarterback, knowing what Nebraska has set up for themselves for the future. Well, and I think you brought up a good point there because if you're a transfer, you're really walking into a a strange situation, right? Nobody wants you to be the starting quarterback, which as a transfer quarterback, that's pretty unusual. <laughs> Right. I that mean, like so, so funny to actually say out loud. Right. But it, it, you're if you're at if you're transferring as a quarterback to Nebraska, you're walking into a situation, probably one of the only situations in the country where not a soul wants you to be the starting quarterback. Right. Like that is a crazy situation to walk into. So you almost have to have a guy that wants to be a coach moving forward as much as he wants to be a player. And a lot of quarterbacks go into coaching. Right. So it's not a crazy ask especially as you get to a especially as you get to some of the older guys guys that maybe use their covid year are on their fifth sixth maybe even their seventh year uh and spe- you know kind of t- tying that into a guy in his seventh year that there were rumors about for this type of role for Nebraska uh, a former husker Casey Thompson is finally why not out of the portal and has committed to Oklahoma for year number Seven. Now that's a guy. I hey, some also... people go to hey, Rodney. Some people go to school for ten years. <laughs> yeah, they're called doctors. Um, I have to imagine that Casey Thompson might also be a transfer quarterback that nobody at Oklahoma wants to start either. Um, no offense to Casey Thompson. We love CT here, but you have to think that if he beats out any of their recruits, then something has gone wrong for Oklahoma. Right? Kind of the same thing with Nebraska. If Whoever is brought in to be a transfer quarterback ends up starting games. Something has gone wrong. Either Rayola wasn't quite ready yet or got banged up a little bit. Something has happened where you're like, ah, I really wish we didn't have to be in this situation, but we are. Casey Thompson's the same way. Now, part of this for him is probably just, I I believe his dad played for Oklahoma. Like he, Mm -hmm. you know, this is a homecoming for him. So part of it literally might just be putting on the uniform, right? Like. There's probably something, you know, we talked about it yesterday with Danny Woodhead, right? There's something that would have been special for him just to run out of the tunnel at Memorial Stadium. Not that he regrets anything that happened at Shadron State, because obviously things worked out phenomenally for him. But you're in a situation where, like, just one time, maybe it would have been nice to run out of the tunnel. I think maybe that's what's happening here with Casey Thompson as much as anything. Because I got to say, if if Oklahoma ends up starting Casey Thompson, like, I have real concerns for Oklahoma. Well, he won't start. He's expected to back up Jackson Arnold anyway, who, I mean, he made his first start in the Alamo Bowl and was, uh, he threw 45 passes in that game, was, was, had a pretty high completion percentage. I think he was around 25, 26. I know he threw for over 350 yards, uh, but he did have three picks. So he showed a little bit of youth there, but. And that's kind of where you have to worry about with the youth, right? Right. But beside all that, I mean, what does Casey Thompson offer? that is a leg up on what Jackson Arnold brought in that one game. Not so much, right? I mean, he had 2,400 yards with the Huskers, 17 touchdowns, didn't really light the world on fire, went to FAU, didn't have enough time to really even uh, put up a a proper stat line, Mm -hmm. a career line there. But you're right. You know, he's an Oklahoma high school star. This dude had 12,000 840 yards of offense and 154 touchdowns in high school in Oklahoma. Like that's incredible. And he's coming home because he knows that already people, people know his name. People know the name Casey Thompson and whether or not he makes a huge name for himself there or not, it is something to say, Hey, you know, I had this wild collegiate career, but I did end up playing where dad played. I, I did end up playing in in my home state, in front of my friends, in front of family, in front of people that knew my name coming out of high school. You know, when you're reading off his high school stats there, I was like, where have I heard numbers like that before? And then I, it, it clicked that it was when we were talking about Clayton Thune earlier this week as a, as a Dana Holgerson disciple, mm-hmm. right? That it was like 12,000 yards in college, 140 some touchdowns, something like that. And I was like, oh, that's pretty similar, which kind of reminded me you know, we hadn't talked about Dana Holgerson in a couple of days here because, well, you know, other things have been happening. Uh, and know, that's kind of quieted down a bit. So what I've heard recently, just wanted to give a little update, is that he is in contention for an analyst role only. So that that is 
he wouldn't be an OC. He wouldn't be quarterback coach. He'd be an analyst, which kind of lines up with a lot of the things he said when he was at Houston that last year, where he's like, kind of seems like he's over the recruiting thing. Um, kind of seems like he wants more of a, 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 a scaled back role and but to still be involved with the game and that's basically what an analyst is right um so he can provide some expertise there if he ends up getting the job uh but that means my guy glenn thomas is still in line for that role that we talked about as the quarterback coach co-oc the way um the way i've thought he's been for the last i don't know month or so uh the problem is the steelers just won't die so they we have to wait for their season to end no offense db i know you yeah i don't know you're rooting for him to keep going but uh you know the as soon as the steelers season is over i imagine we will get an announcement on glenn thomas shortly after that well and you know i almost wonder too if the huskers are waiting for that move to be made whether it is glenn thomas or or somebody else whoever ends up being the quarterback's coach to then go out into the portal and pick the quarterback that you want to join the room if it is a veteran guy. TK on the stream uh, doesn't think they're going to get one. He thinks if it's anybody, it's going to be another high school guy. I, there's, I just don't see it. Uh, there's already now two high school guys in the room. I, I don't think it makes sense to add a Might third, be a Juco guy. But Might be a Juco guy. Juco guy could could make a little bit of sense. Uh, they yeah. have some names in the room as well, but it's it's nothing that jumps off the page. Uh, I will say this, though. If it is Glenn Thomas, Glenn Thomas may have a guy that he likes or yeah. uh, that he sees, and he'll just go to rule and say, we need to bring this guy into the room because here's how it can help us. And if he lays out this master plan to Coach Rule, who is such a uh, – well, he, he trusts for one. Mm -hmm. He trusts the the views of his – of his coordinators, of his staff members. But two, if you have a well thought out plan, it's kind of hard to say this isn't going to work because who knows it, what's going to work in, in such a new system like this when they're trying to, to flip over and turn the page on a ton of different things. If Glenn Thomas has all this experience, he Coach Rule's not, not the type of guy to say, no, it's my way or the highway. He's like, no, let's embrace. Let, let's do it. Yeah. Let's go your way. I like your vision. And we're going to see if it works. So comes over in what let's just say february uh, and yeah, then i would say in. like a week and a half maybe but I, not even till february i don't think i think within the next like 10 days back end, I, so, assuming so back end of january assuming pittsburgh doesn't win this week which i highly doubt they'll go very <laughs> far especially since tj watt is out right um yeah. tk did clarify he meant uh, a commit in the 2025 class. Okay, so I, I understand where his head's going there. Which is totally fair. I, I do think they will get a transfer. Might be a Juco guy. Might be a backup somewhere else. Listen, it's not going to be a sexy transfer at quarterback. It's going to be like a probably a guy who hasn't done much starting. They probably just want another body in the room who's been in college football, maybe somebody that runs a similar system to what they're trying to do. Because the issue with Heinrich Harburg, and I know they like Heinrich, uh, like genuinely they like Heinrich and um, so they're I, I think they're more comfortable with him as the backup quarterback than the rest of us are but I still think you're talking about two different offenses between Dylan and uh, Heinrich Harburg so the big thing I think ends up being finding someone who has a similar comfortability in the offense even if the play calls change in terms of a hey, maybe we go a little run heavy here maybe we don't you know try and air it out as much as we would with with DR you probably are looking for a guy with a more similar skill set. That way you don't really have to change the offense that much. You see this all the time in the NFL where if you've got like a super mobile guy, you try to have a mobile backup so you can kind of have the, the same sort of offense and system and whatever. That's kind of what I imagine they're going to do here. It's, again, not going to be a sexy guy, not going to be a big-time commit, maybe an FCS guy, maybe a JUCO guy, but somebody that's just a little bit older so they aren't relying on a true freshman as a, a a true freshman that they want to redshirt, by the way, in DK as someone that they may have to put into play at some point. Well, so Dylan Rayola is is slotted up as as QB one right now in everybody's mind. OK, yeah. so let's just play out this scenario for a moment, because you said it doesn't have to be a sexy guy. Um, I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum now. Are you okay 
with it just being Heinrich Harburg then, who has a year of experience, who isn't the most sexy of options to back up Dylan Rayola, but has done enough in his career to show you that he can suffice at least for a short time? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a fair question. My concern, again, would be stylistically. Like, I just don't know how much Harburg makes sense stylistically for what I assume they'll be running, you know, with the possible addition of a Dana Holgerson as an analyst. Like, what I assume they're going to be trying to run for Dylan Rayola doesn't make sense as an offense for a uh, for a Heinrich Harburg. Like, we're not in the same neighborhood there. So that would be my bigger concern. Like, I I like that he's got experience. I like that he's got... Um, you know, I mean, all five games that Nebraska won last year were with him as the starting quarterback. Like that's, that matters to me, even if he is a flawed, uh, quarterback. I also think that, I mean, think about the difference we saw from spring Heinrich Harburg to fall Heinrich Harburg under this coaching staff. Like he might be a lot better next year. Like, I don't think he's going to overtake Dylan by any means, but he no. might be significantly better than we saw him last year. He'll have an off season to work on his throwing motion. You know, he might be in a spot where by fall, all of us are dramatically more comfortable with him as the backup, even though we may not know it because we haven't seen him. Right. He might, we might see that in spring. Where we're like, Oh, Heinrich actually looks all right. Maybe we're okay with him as the backup. I still think just for depth purposes, because if you want to re redshirt DK, then you're still only at two scholarship quarterbacks that you feel okay playing pretty much the whole year. Right. DK can get his four games in, but I would think you would want that number to be three outside of DK so that you don't have to worry about possibly burning his red shirt in an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Right. So that to me is why I want the third, the extra guy in the room. And again, why it's going to be a not sexy name whatsoever, because you're talking about maybe even a third string quarterback. Like you'd be competing with Harburg for the backup job. Probably that's where you're, kind of getting into a spot where it's like, yeah, this guy really wants to be a coach. Um, and he just wants to use his last year of eligibility to kind of make that happen and find out, uh, you know, what type of people he'll be around different types of coaches and stuff like that. So that's what I think is going to happen. I don't think it'll happen until spring. I think it'll happen after the spring period because where guys see, Hey, I'm not really in the pecking order here or whatever. And I don't really like where I'm at in this spot or, you know, we're going to have a whole other, uh, we're going to have a whole nother rotation of coaches leaving here in a minute, which we haven't even gotten to yet. Um, but we will get to that coming up next because there's three names that have emerged as leading candidates for that job in Alabama. And one of them is really off the radar. And one of them has really good reason to say yes. More coming up next on Herd Out Sports Radio. Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio here on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. I'm Ravi Lula, Andrew Rogers here with me, our fearless leader, Sasha Durkin, back at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill, making sure we get out on the air, and we greatly appreciate it here on a, frankly, terrible Friday morning. Just the, the wind, the cold, the snow, not a fan. Um, luckily, you know, I had a... <laughs> I had a electric fireplace delivered to my house yesterday because my basement gets a little chilly. So uh, we've got that rocking in the basement right now. Uh, so we're doing okay. Oh, there we go. You got the real thing going? We're rocking it too. Nice. I don't know. You can hardly see it. <laughs> I, I that... built that with my own bare hands today. Did you? Into the cold. Incredible. Yeah, I, I, I dried the wood myself. I woke what up really you... early. I say, what time did you get up to chop the wood on that thing? Yeah, it was like 2.30, and I, um, you know what, I put on my fake beard so that it looked like it froze as I was walking back inside like I was a true lumberjack. Yeah, and, me too. Uh, See, and now it looks it looks so good that it it almost looks fake, Robbie. I know. You know, people won't believe it's real, but that's that's all right. Uh, we so are... Ignore the cord that's ex <laughs> connected to it. I don't know yeah. why that's there. Listen, it's uh, don't worry about that. Don't, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain there. Um, we are coming to you on a Friday uh, as we obviously are at our homes as we get this show going. Um, as we were leaving the break there, we were kind of talking about some potential coaching candidates that have emerged as the leading guys for that Alabama job. One of them is a surprise because 
a lot of what we heard yesterday was no internal candidates, no internal candidates, no internal candidates. And at the end of the day, we hear, ah, maybe Tommy Reese, who is, of course, an internal candidate, former Notre Dame quarterback and former Notre Dame uh, offensive coordinator. I know Brian Kelly asked him to go with him when he left for LSU. He decided to stay at uh, Notre Dame at the time. Then Alabama came calling and he couldn't say no to Coach Saban. Uh, Tommy Reese is incredibly well thought of in the coaching industry. Really young. I want to say he's. I think he's 31. I would say say 31 or 32. Super young. I mean, you're talking even younger than Dan Lanning. I can't even imagine. I mean, like getting that job at that age as your first head coaching job seems nuts to me. So I, I don't think he's the guy. I really don't. But he is getting an interview. Um. The other two guys, because Lanning came out yesterday and was like, nope, we're staying here. We like it here at Oregon. Went as far as to say, hey, if you're le- you're worried about your coach leaving, come to Oregon because we're not going anywhere. Um, so Dan Lanning seems to be off the table. The guys that are on the table, two guys that we mentioned yesterday, and two guys without Saban ties, which I think is interesting. Kalen DeBoer, who we just saw coach in the national championship game my uh one of my favorite coaches in the country absolutely love Kalen DeBoer and Mike Norvell down at Florida State and we talked about this a little bit yesterday and this was before some more news even broke and I said there's a lot of guys that have reasons to say no to this job because it's a hard job it's a big job and following a guy like Saban is never an enviable position right There's not a ton of guys with a reason to say yes, but Mike Norvell is a guy with a reason to say yes. A lot of reasons. I would say he had reasons yesterday. He's got even more reasons today as uh, the NCAA hammered Florida State with NIL violation sanctions. Which What are those? I was going to say, I was going to say, that's not a real thing because – Basically, the NCAA washed their hands and says, good luck, everybody. NIL is now legal if your state says it is, but we're out. That's been their stance the entire time. So, like, I don't want to go all conspiracy theory guy here on you. And I know the NCAA doesn't control the college football playoff. But is there any chance that after Florida State eviscerated the college football playoff for leaving them out, college football playoff has a little call to the NCAA be like, hey, Get your boys in check over here. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm just saying, it's it's oddly coincidental that Florida State, and I was reading the violations, and I was like, I don't know what they did wrong that everybody isn't. Like, I, first of all, I didn't know there were NIL violations. Like, I know technically the university is not supposed, supposed to facilitate the deals, but, it, like, let's be honest here. That's how it works, right? It's like, uh, yeah, the collective's yeah, we, doing it. Yeah, we say the collective. The collective's but... doing it. It's like, okay, come on. This has been the worst kept open secret of all time. And all of a sudden, Florida State, who just happens to have been very unhappy with the ACC and very unhappy with the college football playoff and is suing their conference, by the way, all of a sudden, Florida State is the one that is in violation of these NIL rules that nobody really knew existed. Because, as I said before, the NCAA is like, NIL rules? What NIL rules? This is all on you guys. Good luck. Whatever your legislature says is okay. That's what's okay. So, here's where we are now is Florida State's offensive coordinator, Alex Atkins, is punished for like a two-year show cause. He can't recruit on the road for a year. A bunch of other stuff. The university is docked, or the the program is docked scholarships. They're docked football budget. They're docked a bunch of these things. Mm -hmm. And if Mike Norvell didn't already have a reason to want to leave after being left out of the college football playoff because the ACC is a second-class citizen in college football now, then all of these violations and sanctions and whatever, listen, if I'm Mike Norvell, if I get that call, I'm I'm not walking. I am running out the door. It's like, we'll figure the contract out later. Let's go. Because this would never happen to Bama. On e- on any front, this would never happen to Bama. Now, Robbie, there's a lot to unpack there. That, yeah. uh, you Sorry, just I went presented. a little rant there. Uh, I, had a lot, I had a lot of feelings. 
<laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll start with the sanctions because, uh, again, I think they're absolutely outrageous. Um, it, doesn't everybody just do what they want? Like that. That's kind of what I said when I read all of the things that were being sanctioned against Florida State. I mean, look, look what Michigan did. Okay, let's go to the school up north. Mm -hmm. I know we've been uh, attacking Michigan left and right, but you know what? They haven't been able to block the blow, so I'm going to keep punching until they can. The way Atkins and whatever booster um, set up this this meeting with a with a future uh, potential, because he, he ended up staying at Georgia, uh, a, a potential Florida State athlete, uh, sounds a lot like just a cheeseburger. It was just a cheeseburger. Does it not? Does yeah. it not sound just like that? So yeah. if it does, why are we picking and choosing what uh, what violations are, I guess, more shady? Um, because like you, you, you can't just have all of this stuff take place with Florida State, right? You kick them out of the playoffs or two in the conference, all that jazz. Uh, and you just can't pick what violation is worse don't have any rules or laws in place to keep this shady stuff from happening. There's also no scale to tell you this yeah. is like a, a level three and this is a level one. There's no scale actually out there to tell us this information. Yeah, so because the NCAA are, was hands off the entire time. They're like, we don't want to scale. We don't want to know. That's the thing. They don't want to know. Yet they're digging their nose into business now because they feel like they have to regain control over what? Over, over over the shady stuff you did? Like, you can't just say well, two wrongs make a right now. Like, that, 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 that that's not how this works. So I will say the NCAA investigation into Michigan isn't done yet. All we saw was internal and Big Ten investigation. If the NCAA doesn't hammer them for actually cheating on things that impacted the game, and the way they hammered Florida State for this thing that literally every person, like I hear coaches talking openly about doing this and they're like, oh, well, I didn't mean exactly that I was facilitating, blah, blah, whatever. Like if they don't hammer Michigan for actually cheating, then I think it is the death knell for the NCAA because these power five schools are just not going to deal with it. And it might be big problem time for the ACC as well, because they may just end up like Florida State might be able to get enough teams to disband the conference. Like that's where we're at with college football right now. I think they're in really, really dangerous shape. And Florida State's in bad shape too, because I, I think it's going to cause them to lose their football coach. At the end of the day, I think they lose Norvell to Alabama because of this, because I don't think DeBoer is leaving. Breaking news here real quick before we go to Adam McClintock, Jared Mayo for or Gerard Mayo, sorry, Gerard Mayo for mm -hmm has been named the head coach of the Patriots. Um, that just came down a few seconds ago via Adam Schefter. Uh, so that is the, the, not a long opening there, less than 24 hours. No, and internal, internal, inside linebackers coach. So Formerly. maybe we're going to see Tommy Reese internal as well. Who knows? Uh, I doubt it. But we're going to talk to Adam McClintock coming up next, college football professor here on Herd at Sports Radio. Wrapping up hour number one here on Herd at Sports Radio on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. I'm Ravi Lula. Andrew Rogers here with me. Well, here with me in spirit, at least, as we are going <laughs> remote this I'm morning. right behind you. Uh, oh, God. Um, we <laughs> Don't are, turn around. <laughs> we are joined now, we hope, on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline by Adam McClintock. Adam, can you hear us? We cannot. He may be able to hear us. Him. We can't hear him. <laughs> we cannot hear him, uh, Sasha. I don't know if there's anything we can do there. Um, but we are, you know, there's some technical challenges doing the show from three different locations. Uh, so hopefully we're able to uh, figure that out for our guests this morning. Um, in the meantime, Sasha, if we get him for some reason, just patch him right in, and and we'll we'll stop whatever. And have him just about. talk. Have him just talk right over us, because that's the only way. Um, he's apparently here, but we cannot hear him. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what to do there. Uh, so I guess we'll just keep going. At uh, Adam, can you say something? Can we hear you? Nothing. Nope, still nothing. Um. 
doesn't look like we're going to be able to connect with Adam. That's here. all right. You know, we're, we're troubleshooting today, Un, right? Unless, like, there's, there's uh, unless he's able to join us on the stream, Sasha. I don't know if you want to ask him if that's a possibility. But um, in the meantime, still plenty to talk about. We were uh, talking about the Mike Norvell situation uh, in the, with Florida State and possibly him going to Alabama. Um, DeBoer, also a, a big candidate there. You know, we talked about yesterday with Fit. Just he's he hasn't been in the South much. Um, you know, at his various stops, been all Midwest and West Coast. Um, so uh, we'll we, we'll see. But he is. I mean, I he's a guy that I think succeeds just about anywhere. Um, and then we mentioned Tommy Reese, which I, I kind of agree. Um, one of our listeners here, I didn't see who it was, said Bama fans would lose their mind if it was Reese. I tend to agree. That's Corey. Think- yeah, uh, yeah, there it is, Corey. Uh, I don't think he's a real candidate. I think it's kind of a token interview um, just to, you know, say they interviewed somebody on staff. I, I know he's really tends to be really popular with his players and with the other coaches. So, you know, and maybe he blows them away. I don't know. But I, I would imagine at this point we're looking at DeBoer or Mike Nove- Norvell. Um, and between those two guys norvell saying yes makes more sense uh for all the reasons we talked about with the violations floor state getting left out of the playoff the acc i mean if you're in the college football world right now right there's basically especially going into next year you've got the big 10 and the sec those are that's your upper crust everybody else it's not really power five group of five anymore it's like elite tier that's Big Ten SEC. You've got your former Power Five. That's like Big 12, ACC, whatever's left of the Pac-12 teams. You know what? You know whatever. And then you at got some it. point the Mountain. At some point the Mountain West is more than the Pac-12. Yeah, it's well, and they're gonna end up being basically the same thing. It seems like I don't know. Uh, but you're there's not there's not Power Five group of five anymore. Now it's Big Ten SEC. Big 12, ACC, and then the group of five. And if you're Mike Norvell, there's absolutely no reason, because he's a first-class coach. There's no reason for him to be in a second-class conference. And that's what the ACC has quickly devolved into, not only because of getting left out of the playoff and not not, uh, campaigning for the playoff the way the SEC did and things like that, but also because they're going to be falling further and further behind financially because of that stupid deal that they signed through 2036. By the end of that thing, I mean, Florida State estimates already they're losing $30 million a year compared to SEC schools. And that's only going to continue to get more dramatic as the years progress. And then they get targeted to be made an example of by the NCAA, which this is what the NCAA does, by the way. This is what they've always done. You can go all the way back to, like, SMU with the death penalty, right? SMU was not, like, they were not nearly alone, and they weren't even the best at it in terms of paying players in the 80s. This was a rampant, huge problem. And the reason that it was SMU that got their program demolished was because the NCAA wanted to set an example. They wanted to make an example out of them. They did the same thing to Miami in the 90s. They wanted to make an example out of them. They go after teams that are not traditional blue bloods because they never go after the traditional blue bloods. They will never go, not, I mean, listen, I know Alabama was on some sanctions in the 90s, but not like anything we saw from lesser teams lesser programs the only team that they ever really hammered that is a blue blood is penn state after the joe paterno thing and that's a totally unprecedented situation right they don't go after the big dogs because they know that the big dogs are their meal ticket they go after kind of that next tier of teams the acc level tier of teams to make an example out of them to be like hey see we take this seriously it's like nobody asked you to take this seriously we were pretty much everyone was okay with the NIL just being the Wild West mm-hmm. and everything. Just well, and, being... and and now you started something that you have to follow through with all the time. You can't just make but an they're example not going of to. somebody. They right. won't. 
Right. And that's that's the big problem. And that's mm -hmm. when you were bringing that up last segment of when you were talking about Michigan. Like it shouldn't even be a question of now they have to go after Michigan. No, they should have started with Michigan. Mm -hmm. If they were going to start with Michigan and then follow up with Florida State, then things uh, timeline wise would match up a little, maybe make sense. But it doesn't make sense anymore to now jump back. You can't be like, oh, well, now we probably have to go back to here. And then, oh, then what about that school? Like that school? Well, do we let them go? Do we not? Like, are we only really just mad at Florida State because they called us out and they were right? But we don't, we're, we're in denial. So we're, we're not going to tell anybody that also, we're right. Like, here's the thing about the Florida State thing that I can't figure out is every NCAA investigation is that I've ever seen has taken years to complete. I mean, years. And they get this Florida State, State thing done in about 14 minutes. And you just go, what, what just happened here? Like, how on earth are they still investigating the Michigan thing that's been going on for years? And they're, they get the Florida State investigation done in nothing flat. Um, Adam McClintock, I think, is joining us on StreamYard there now. Adam. Hey, guys. To see you. We appreciate you being flexible. We're a little, uh, a little snowed in here right now, so that we're having some issues getting all the technology working. But we appreciate you joining us. That's what I hear. That's why you're Shane didn't make it in today, huh? Uh, yeah, none, none of us made it in today except the day for Sasha, who is, who's, uh, who's a, a bigger badass than the rest of us. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I've heard. I've heard. So. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, let's hop right that. into the Alabama uh, situation of it all. Yeah. Seems like the, the three names that have come up that are the most prominent are DeBoer, Norvell, and Tommy Reese. What I wanted to ask you from your what your analytics show is – I guess first and foremost, because the outlier there seems to be Tommy Reese. What do your metrics kind of tell us about what sort of coordinator he's been? You know, he's been he's been a good a good coordinator, not a, not a great one. So that would be a kind of a head scratching hire for me. Usually, a, a guy who takes over a, a program like Alabama uh, from from a coordinator level has to be somebody like a Brent Venables, who's been the best coordinator at their you know at at their program for, for, for a decade plus or, or five years plus. Tommy Reese has, has been good, but he hasn't been, you know, a, a dominant offensive coordinator. I mean, um, his, his Notre Dame offenses were good, not great. The Alabama offense this year was good, not great. I mean, they're all top 20, top 25 offenses, but they were nothing was ever dominant from, from his unit. So um, that would be kind of a shocking development to me, especially at a place like Alabama. Now, if, if this is like, Oh, the level of maybe the Arkansas or 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 somewhere like that. I could maybe more see it, but that would be kind of a stretch for Tommy Reese to take over a place like Alabama. Adam, could it be because he's worked with Jalen Milrow and Milrow is going to be the starter again next year that it just kind of makes sense for him to transition into that role? Or would it make more sense for him to stay in the role he's in now and pick from some of the other – head coaches that have a lot of or a pretty nice track record in Norvell and DeBoer well I mean in my opinion you don't make a decision on a head coach based on a one-year starting quarterback I mean that, that's a long-term decision you're making based on a kid that's going to be there one but what, what does he have one more year two more years Miller has there so I think you you have to look at it long term and say okay for the long-term success of Alabama we need to hire this head coach don't don't let the the current roster situation dictate what you know who the next head coach is going to be um that's my opinion on it uh but let's just let's just let's just get things one thing straight right now you're not going to replace alabama or replace dick saban at alabama you're going to be hiring a new head coach you're not going to be you're not going to be replacing Al nick saban if that makes any sense at all we've seen this time and time again where you know the next guy up after a legend just struggles it, it's tough it's a tough gig so um it's 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 one of those things where where um, it's 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 just gonna it's just gonna be tough no matter who comes in there, especially for somebody like Tommy Reese who maybe isn't qualified for it. Adam, we got about a minute left here, and hopefully we can catch up with you next week uh, and get a, a full interview in. But um, if it is DeBoer or Norvell, who are some names that you would look at to possibly fill those spots at either Washington or Florida State, especially considering what's going on? with Florida State and the NCAA right now? Well, Florida State, um, I, I think you'd have to look. Man, that that would be tougher. Um, off the top of my head, that one's, that one's the tougher of the two. I think 
if you're if you're if you're uh, if you're Washington, I think you make a call to East Lansing and say, "Hey, buddy, Jonathan Smith, why don't you come back up the Pacific Northwest?" Mm. I think that's what you do there. Um, either that, or you, or or you call Chris Kleiman at Kansas State, who would be a, a, a perfect fit at Washington after what after what uh, DeBoer has done there. Florida State, that's going to be a lot more tricky just because of we don't know what kind of what kind of penalties are coming down from the NCA as far as you know for the, for the NIL stuff they've gotten into. Um, I don't really, maybe, you know, that I like Jamie Chadwell. Hey, me too. <laughs> so would, me I too. Jamie Chadwell, that would be a perfect spot for him to get uh, his start at is, is somewhere, somewhere like Florida State, especially if they're looking for somebody to kind of, to kind of uh, fill in there if, if there are sanctions coming. So that's Adam McClintock. We'll catch up with you next week, Adam. We appreciate you being flexible and joining us on the stream yard today. And uh, we'll get a, we'll get a full uh, interview with you. Full report. We appreciate it. Sounds good, guys. That's Adam McClintock, Thanks, college football professor from Matrix Analytical. Coming up next, we've got Nick Ba, uh, college basketball analyst for FS1. Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're kicking off hour number two here on a snowy Friday. And I want to remind you, if you're out driving, keep your hands on the wheel, eyes, and focus straight ahead. As the driver, you have one job, and that is to drive. Make sure you get you get where you're going safely. This message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Joining us now on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is our guy, Nicholas Allen Baugh from FS1, from the Nick Baugh Podcast, from the Chicken Nick Show. Nick, what's going on, man? Just trying to survive the snow, just like everybody else. <laughs> man, it's rough Nick, out here. I, I, get, I got to tell you, man, like every time I hear your name, like especially your last name, and, and maybe it should be your intro music for now on, uh, it, it reminds me of the song Bad Romance when like Lady Gaga is like, rah, 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 uh, uh, and I'm like inserting ba into it. So I don't know. Maybe, it's a little weird thing. Maybe it's bad. I don't, but that, that's what we should do. That should be your music bed when you come in. I, you know, I think like the one thing that Major League Baseball, WWF, like they had figured out is like anytime somebody comes to the plate, enters into a situation, you play music. It's just better that way. Like it's just better mm -hmm. when, when you have some sort of walk up music, even into a room under a radio station, it doesn't matter. So I'm with it. I'm with it, Andrew. I'll take it. I'll take that. That sounds out. like a job for your uh, podcast co host, uh, Matt Schick, to, to be able to lay down that track. Maybe, uh, bust out the pipes for a for a little Nick Ba tribute song, you know? He, he used to, so anytime I would like miss the show, whether I, say I was sick or like I was traveling with Creighton or whatever, he had Eminem, Guess Who's Back. <laughs> that was how we'd start every song, but it would just be my screams, my laughs, my misspeak, <laughs> like in, in, in between all of it. It was, it was a good way to, to set the tone for the day. That's outstanding. <laughs> we love it. Uh, you know, speaking of Creighton, they uh, struggled a little bit to start Big East play. They Their offense at times this year has looked a little stagnant, hasn't really had the ball popping around and had that off-ball movement that we're used to seeing from Greg McDermott's offense. How concerned are you, I guess, throughout the season? Because it seems like in the last handful of years, they got – a lot more comfortable with kind of that pick and roll focused offense with Ryan Nemhard. You had Marcus Zagorowski before that, and that was really their skill set, right? You don't really have that guy on the team this year. Seems like they maybe need to dig back a little bit, bit further in the playbook into those pre Marcus Zagorowski years, and they haven't really found a comfortability with that yet. What's your level of confidence of them being able to figure that out during the regular season before postseason play? Well, the thing that, first of all, that's amazing is I'm totally with you. There are times I'm like, man, this team has a hard time scoring at times. This mm -hmm. team, when it gets bogged down in the half court, isn't as potent. But I'm looking at it right now. They're 15th in Ken Palm <laughs> Palm. So, so I don't know if, like, we, we also maybe need to – I'm sure if Greg McDermott was here, he'd, like – I don't know if you guys are watching Living Color, Homie to Clown, like, smack you, like, <laughs> yep. you'd, like you'd have to smack us. Like, geez, guys, like, our, our offensive numbers – Effective field goal percentage, fourth in the country, you know, like two point field goal percentage. I'm just looking at it right now. They're second or the third in the country. So it, it, it is weird that they've created this uh, 
this bar offensively for what it's supposed to look like uh, with the pick and roll lob threat, with some of the pace, with some of the ball movement, different things like that, that we expect just a, you know, a buzzsaw every single night. And to, to circle back to your question, I am concerned. Uh, and I think that it's going to get more challenging as they get further into conference play when you have these teams that understand your pet plays, understand your tendencies, understand all those sorts of things. And like you said, Robbie, I just don't know if this team is blessed with that point guard that they've had over the years. Maurice Watson, Marcus Zagorowski, uh, Tysha Alexander could do it in, in spurts. Um, certainly Ryan Nemhard that was good in those pick, pick and roll situations of hitting that roll man. And also, if you disrespected him, he could, you know, they could go in there and, and score themselves. So, uh, I, I'm a little concerned on that front. I'm not concerned with Greg McDermott being able to to figure out the best, you know, combination, the best way of attacking things offensively. I find myself when I'm watching the games screaming, get the ball to Kalkbrenner, get the ball to Kalkbrenner. Like I think that needs to be something that you establish every single game. They did that against Providence. Uh, didn't really need to do it as much against DePaul. Kind of everything was working uh, against the Blue Demons. But uh, any way you slice it, you got to establish Kalkbrenner in the interior. Um, but yeah, there, there are, I think the last time we talked, there's just an athleticism deficiency overall on the perimeter with this group that I think could make things hard for them offensively uh, as, as things progress. Nick, I, I want to touch on that Kalkbrenner point you made there for a minute, because I know it seems like kind of dramatically different types of roles, but really getting the ball into Kalkbrenner in the post kind of, allows the same impact on a defense as that really effective pick and roll, right? Because you get a piece of the paint, you make a defender choose between either doubling or switching or whatever the case is. Like you get a lot of the same results. Is that why, is that part of the reason you, why you want to see them hammered into Kalkbrenner? Or, I mean, also he like shoots like 70% from the field. So that helps. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it, there, there's certainly that, that he's like top 10 all time in field goal percentage in, in college basketball history right now. But he's different than like a Zach Eady or, you know, some of the, the the great post players where he's not necessarily a dude that you just like, you pound it into him. He he can peck dribble and back you down and, and put you in, in the blender. That's not really like how he's built. So I don't think you can necessarily just get lazy and just kind of have simple sets to kind of throw it into him. But you're right. At the end of the day, you got to get a po- you got to get a paint touch either via the drive, via the post up, do something to collapse that defense, put the defense into a predicament. Because right now, when, when things get stagnant, there's the ball just stays on the perimeter. Creighton gets pressed out past the three point line, and they're having a hard time getting the ball into the post. And then I also think the other reason that I, I call Brenner to me. The more you can get his emotion up and get him really, really – sometimes he, he's a really laid-back dude. I'm sure both of you guys have talked to Ryan. Ryan is like you could he, – he is going to – his announcement when he came back to Creighton is like, I, uh, hey, I'm just announcing that I'm coming back to Creighton. Like, you know, anything you do to get that guy, like, engaged, and whether that's throwing the ball to him, I think uh, against Providence there was clearly an emphasis of that, and I thought it, it helped out. But, yeah, I uh, – there are all those reasons you you named, Robbie, I think are, are spot on and why you got to make sure you're getting him involved. Nick, it's been an absolute chaotic week across the top teams in college basketball. Who are the risers and fallers for you in the upcoming polls? And do you expect some of these teams just to remain exactly where they are because of all the losses across the board? It has been wild, right? I mean, uh you know, I, I think, though, it, it's been wild on from the outside looking in on the surface of it, but am I stunned Houston lost at Iowa State? I'm not stunned. You know, like, that's a hard place to play, and, and that you know, TJ's got that group playing with an edge, and they've gone to the NCAA tournament a couple of different times now. Um, I'm not stunned that Purdue lost at Nebraska either. Uh, and in and, and some way, I've seen Kansas quite a bit. I'm not necessarily stunned that they lost at Central Florida either. So, like, all these teams, Andrew, have enough flaws that it's it's not too jarring if they go get pushed, test, or even beat. Um, I think the team that I'm – I'm, I'm worried about Marquette right now. I think the last time we talked, I said they were in, in one of those kind of, like, top four or five to me. There's there's something with them 
that they just kind of don't have that same mojo and edge to them. And I'm not, I'm not totally sure what to put my finger on with it. I, one of the things that I was interested to see what would happen this year, and they, they navigated it well early, is just the role reversal flip mentally, where they had that chip on their shoulder, trying to prove everybody wrong all year last year. They're picked ninth, um, and they can kind of play that card. Well, you can't play that card this year. When you won the Big East regular season title, you won the tournament, you're a preseason top 10 team. Some people are picking you as a, as a final four group. And sometimes it's hard to maintain your edge when you're going to get everybody's best shot, no matter what, because you're, you know, you got, you, you, you come with, with some notoriety. Uh, so I, and, and everybody expects you to win right now. Like, so there, I'm, I'm worried, I'm worried about them a little bit right now. Uh, just cause I have, I have pretty high expectations for, for them going in. Um, I, I think UConn is a group that maybe we're just all like, I don't need to need to start putting in that upper echelon a little bit more frequently. Uh, I thought they'd miss Sonogo, Jackson, and Hawkins maybe a little bit more than they have. Uh, they just keep on winning, man. They, they just keep on winning. They look pretty darn good. They got that swag to them. Uh, but I would say, Andrew, I'm worried. Marquette's the one team that, like, mm. you know, it's not only do they lose, they, just, they haven't played great uh, over the last couple of weeks either. We're talking with Nick Baugh, college basketball analyst on FS1, host of various podcasts here on Herd at Sports. Uh, you know, you mentioned that Purdue-Nebraska game, and I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about that because you put a, uh, a video out on Twitter. You do these little breakdowns from your hotel room about, which I love, uh, and, and it was about Nebraska's doubling the post and how it kind of bit them against Indiana, even though they won that game, and against Wisconsin where they got smacked a little bit. But then we saw against Purdue how their ability to double Edie and cause him problems was super effective in their win there. What did they do differently from the Wisconsin to the Purdue game that allowed that to go from, hey, this is a place where you can beat Nebraska to, hey, they just kind of locked down the best big in the country? Honestly, in my opinion, they didn't do anything schematically different it was more about and i'm patting my my chest here <laughs> like it was more about they blew around i mean you you guys know like sometimes we overdo you know adjustments sometimes it's like no the scheme works you got to do it better and you got to do it with more purpose i thought their rotations were stronger i thought they were more physical meeting people at the rim as they were diving off of double teams i thought they were more decisive when they were coming with the double team so i don't think they did anything different other than they did it better and they did it more physical because i think they knew if we don't we are in trouble the other thing they did out of it is they scrambled out of it like you know they 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 did a good job of they didn't necessarily take the easy way out of like, okay, well, I'm going to take away the the dive man out of the double team to the, to the, to the paint and set that, that three pointers wide open and somebody else, I guess will have to get it. No, they were, they were, they were flying around and trying to take away both or at least contest those three point shots. But I think one of the interesting things for me, at least is like, in some ways that game and that defensive plan that you saw, Zach Eady he was kind of the, uh, along with whether it was Luca Garza, Trace Jackson Davis, a lot of these like murderers row big men that Fred Hoiberg saw over the course of the last four years here in the Big Ten. That's why he made his adjustment schematically defensively to go to this new system. He was like, listen, we, we cannot just play straight up in the post. We got to have a unique sort of defensive scheme that allows for these post players to get doubled, to get uncomfortable. And I, it was just kind of unique to see like a, a full-fledged schematical program adjustment show itself in a big moment in a good way. Now, it certainly helps offensively when you throw in where they make 14 threes. I mean, that like that's going to that's gonna help any sort of situation um, regardless of what you're doing. But, yeah, I, I, when you look at what Nebraska, what are they, 19 and 6, I think, since February 1st of last year, like – I, I think what you're seeing is like their defensive schematic plan. It's pretty good, you know. Like it, it's it's when do, when done right and done with purpose, it, it can it can yield pretty good results. And I think the Zach Eady and and players like him are the reason why they made that change. 
Nick, I want to jump back to the Big East for a moment because there's a lot of new faces leading these teams, and we're about at that midseason point. We may have actually already surpassed it. I'm not exactly too sure on that. But who's who's the one coach that's impressed you so far out of the new faces? Would it be the veteran and Rick Patino? Would it be the rookie, Kim English? Or could you even throw the transfer, Ed Cooley, in there? I mean, I think I could throw up two other guys that you didn't even name. I mean, oh, I, I think Shaheen Holloway, what he, what he's done here at the at the start of, of conference play, knocking off a lot of the big dogs in the conference, beat UConn, beat Marquette. Um, after after a, a non-con that didn't necessarily serve as a precursor to, like, look out for this team, um, I, I'd throw Thad Mata in there, too. I think what, what Thad mm. has done – this season has been has been really impressive. He had to basically hit the complete reset button, brought in a whole bunch of new transfers. Um, I had their very first game of the year. And I remember taking off the headset and thinking to myself, like, that team's a lot better. I don't know what that means. That might be, mean they're <laughs> the playing game still in New York come, come the Big East tournament. But I just know that team is a lot better. And I can tell talking to Thad that, like, you know, there's that whole cliche line of, like, of, you know, before you can win with the group, you got to be, they got to be the kind of group you can lose with, you know, like you, you, you can ride with these dudes. And I could tell Thad, he kind of said like last year, I couldn't ride with those dudes. Like that, that group last year, they kind of get punched in the mouth and they, they fold. He was like, this is not like that. And I think they've, they've shown that. Um, so I've been, I've been really impressed with Shaheen Holloway and, and Thad Mata. I also think Rick Patino, what he's done. It's also a, I mean, I'm excited. I have that game tomorrow on Fox. Uh, very, very intriguing game with St. John's coming to town. I think, Andrew, the reason I maybe look past Rick Patino is because he's he's Rick Patino, And, like, you, <laughs> right. you expect him. Like, I didn't necessarily expect Seton Hall to be sitting tied at first here in mid-January or sit with Butler. But with, like, Rick Patino, you kind of expect you could put the dude on Mars and he would field a <laughs> – a, a team and they would like find a way to compete and, and win. So it's hard to look past what he's doing, but there have been a lot of good coaching jobs so far uh, in the big East. Yeah. Nick, the reason I excluded, uh, you know, Seton Hall and Butler from that conversation was those guys got in 2022. So I was looking Agreed. at the oh, yeah. I from, yeah, 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 yeah. from, from okay. those pictures, but I like where you sat with, with Rick Pitino because you know, First it's St. John's, then it's UConn, then it's Seton Hall, the top three teams in the Big East coming up for Creighton. What would you say is your expectation for the three games? And if you are Creighton and win these three, are you comfortable saying Creighton is the top team in the Big East? Yeah, if you if, if they go if they go three and zero in their next three game stretch here, attention world like it, they, they're they're. They're humming along here. I mean, you you go on the road at UConn and knock them off, and I think you got a you got a St. John's team. I watched their I, I did a you New Mexico UNLV game was flying home from Vegas, and I watched the St. John's Villanova game, and whoa man, St. John's went into Philly and straight up pulled those dudes into an alley and kicked their you know what like from start to finish. So St. John's is playing as good as anybody in the in the country right now. So I I, I say. Yes, like if they if they go three and zero in this next three game stretch, you'd have to put them in that conversation. But I also don't want to like uh, do you. It's hard to not ride that roller coaster. Like when when Creighton lost back to back games against Villanova and Marquette, everybody was like, "What's wrong with this team?" You know, and it's like you know, like yeah, they they they've had they have their deficiencies, but it's a long season, and you're going to lose games, and they built double digit leads and lost them. So it's not like they they you know the ball was tipped and they just got like dominated from start to finish. So. I also don't want to ride that roller coaster, Andrew, but these next three games are going to be massively important. But it starts in about 24 hours, a little over 24 hours from now. It's going to be a great game inside the CHI Health Center with, with the Johnnies coming into town. Nick, something I've been thinking a lot about lately with the Big East and specifically Villanova, what's your level of concern with Kyle Neptune and kind of what he's been able to do through – a year and a half. I think people had high expectations for him. Obviously they dealt with a lot of injuries last year um, and before they were able to kind of round into shape and never really turned into the team that I think most people wanted them to be. And then this year, again, the expectations were kind of high and he hasn't really met the bell. Are, are you concerned at all long-term with Kyle Neptune of Villanova? I think so. Um, I, I think a little bit, 
I, I it's it is hard whenever injuries always are the great variable in how you're judging anything, you know, like uh at the same time you don't want to overdo that, but like Justin Moore, their be- his best player more often than not when he has showed up to games as the head coach, his best player has been in street clothes. Mm-hmm. So maybe Kyle Neptune would homie the clown me <laughs> <laughs> as well and, and smack me in the head like, hey man, like my, my star hasn't been available. So there, there's certainly, there, there's there's that that you have to consider. But I also think one of the reasons beyond the fact that, you know, Jay Wright, I think was was getting a little bit older and, and he had really had an amazing amount of success of late. But I think one of the reasons that Jay Wright is now – sitting with a suit on doing TV is the way he wants to run his program. It's hard to do that now in, in 2023, 2024 and, and beyond. Like if you look at this team, the one thing that all these teams over the years have had is like continuity. And what, you know, they've, they've gone from Archie Diacono to Jalen Brunson to Colin Gillespie, not to mention the good wings to Josh Hart uh, to Mikhail Bridges and DiVincenzo to, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on. And a lot of these guys, it's kind of been a sit and wait your turn and learn program. And it's harder to do that now. I mean, their starting lineup, sure, it was supposed to have Dixon and Justin Moore, but it's it's Burton, it's Bamba, it's Hakeem Hart. It's a lot of new guys. And Villanova runs, it's a, it's a more unique system and style than you think it is. It's very patient. Mm-hmm. It's a all five guys post. It's a lot of shot fakes, extra passes, and not necessarily just go roll the ball out and go go hoop. It's a, it's a little bit more of a complex system to get comfortable in. And so I think to, to bridge things past Neptune is like, okay, can he, because he's trying to do exactly what Villanova's always done. It's, it's harder than you think to get guys, new guys come in and run that system effectively. And the last thing I'll say is like, and I hate the cop out of like, well, I could win if I had Brunson and (laughs) and Bridges and even like, that's not necessarily true. But like, if you're going to, there are certain systems that really, really work if you got the personnel to do it. And the teams that have been good for Nova over the course of the last, you know, five, six, eight years, there've been NBA dudes all over the place where their guy can win one-on-one nine times out of ten. I don't know if this team certainly didn't have it last year. I don't know if this team's as blessed to have – I mean, you tell me. I mean, is there a bunch of pros on that Nova roster? I mean, a healthy Justin Moore, maybe. Uh, but I just don't know if there's a lot of pros out there. So there's also that element of it as well. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I, I'd be. Um, you have to be a little concerned about what, what's happened here over a season and a half with Kyle Neptune at Nova. Nick, right. uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Robbie. I was going to say, we've got about a minute left here with yeah. you, Nick. I just wanted to ask you real quick, uh, Nebraska football. I know you're a huge Nebraska football fan, and and you've been covering them and following them forever as well. They kind of went four for four in their little transfer portal window, and they also picked up a, a lineman just for funsies yeah. uh, that didn't even come visit. How impressed have you been with the targeted and, like, specific and precise nature of how Matt Rule's attacked the transfer portal. Very, very impressed. I always try to urge people to think back when the clock struck zero against Iowa, how you felt about things, and then think about how you feel now. I'd imagine you feel a lot better about things now. That's kind of the nature of the offseason is we have a, a way of, of always getting optimistic and start chugging the Kool-Aid, but I do think it's it's warranted. I felt like the reality of the situation was they needed all they needed all new top skill guys. Like we, and I know that's maybe not nice to say, but they needed a new quarterback, they needed a new running back, they needed a new number one wide receiver. And I think, at least on paper, they probably went out and, and checked all those boxes. And you wonder, Robbie, how much a, a guy like Dylan Riola has, has jump started that. How much, you know, you get the number one quarterback and, you know, a five star, how much that is just magnetic and it, it attracts other top talent. But yeah, I, I'm been really, really impressed with. They've improved their roster over the course of the last month or so. Um, And especially they've gotten not just talent, but they've gotten talent in the right spots that they really, really need as well. That's Nick Ba. He is a college basketball analyst for FS1. He'll be on the call on Big Fox tomorrow for Creighton and St. John's. And, hey, next time we talk, 
I need you to bring one of those shoot 360s up to Omaha for your boy to get some work. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. See what you can do for me, all right? Okay, okay. be patient, my friend. I think all I right. think hopefully that 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 happens sooner than than later. But I got you. All right, I appreciate it. I'll come tap you up tomorrow. Uh, that's Nick Ba, our guy from uh, FS1, and of course Nick Ba Podcast, Chicken Nick. We've got more of Herd Out Sports Radio coming up next. Welcome back to Herd Out Sports Radio. We are halfway through the show and we are getting closer and closer to professional volleyball time here in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the Omaha Supernovas hit the court for the first ever Pro Volleyball Federation match on January 24th against the Atlanta Vibe at the CHI Health Center at 7 p.m. You can get season or single match tickets on sale now at supernovas.com and you're going to see the best talent you've ever seen all on one floor you've got ncaa champions you've got all americans you've got olympians be a part of the volleyball movement sweeping across the country and see your major league volleyball team the omaha supernovas again tickets available at supernovas.com uh speaking of having a little fun playing a little game uh andrew has come up with a has come up with a a unique uh, sort of trivia esque game is that is that fair, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. It's uh, it, essentially the name tells you how the game's going to work. It's Nick Saban versus the field. So you either can choose Nick Saban mm-hmm. or you can choose the field. And okay. I just kind of had a lot of fun, you know, two days ago when Nick Saban said he was going to retire, looking up a bunch of stats and things and 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 fun facts about about the greatest college football coach of all time. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can trick Robbie with any of these things. So I, I'll go through them. We can break them down as we go, too, because some of these are pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'll start with this one, okay? 17 years at Alabama mm-hmm. is currently the longest of any coach in college football. Ooh, I'm going to say – the field kirk ferentz has been at iowa longer than 17 years i know that for sure so i'm gonna save the field there so nice little warm-up for you kirk ferentz has been at iowa since 1999 which is also pretty incredible he won't ever get the 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 same type of love that nick saban got when he retires but he will definitely get his name plastered on a headline on ESPN, whenever Ferentz decides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang up the jacket. Yeah, I mean, he does. You know, he's he's a couple national titles short of saving to get the same, to get the same fanfare. But is that the only one? Is he the only one uh, longer than the 17 at, years? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, longer at the same university. Oh yeah. wow! Um, because um, obviously, you know, you can go a- around. Yeah, guys been bouncing and, around, but yeah, yeah, right. But at the same school, Kirk Ferentz, nineteen ninety nine. All um, right. Now I didn't do I didn't do crazy digging on that either. So there could be a, a group of five school that I'm just completely leaving out. Like Troy Calhoun's been at Air Force for a while, but I don't know mm. how long he's been at Air Force. I think it's that pretty, may have been seventeen. Yeah, I think it's pretty close to when Saban was hired at Alabama. I think it was like late two thousands, if I remember, mid to late two thousands, somewhere in there. All right, next question for you. Or not really a question, more of a uh, more of a prompt. Had did Nick Saban have the highest winning percentage of all active power five coaches? No. I'm gonna say, well, is there a games minimum? Um you know what? I would say there should be, but it doesn't matter. So like it, you're not going to get, um, let's just say, Coach like, Rule, for example. Say Coach Rule went 12 and 0 this year. Like he, there's no like anomaly like that. So, because I mean, like DeBoer is like 25 and three at uh, at Washington. Um, I want to say Ryan Day has a better winning percentage than Nick Saban does. Uh, right, so I'm let, me, gonna... let me look this up because. Those two guys would have a higher winning percentage than Nick, but maybe there is a games four here on the list that I was looking at. Um, let's just say. Because it might be like, if it's like a hundred game minimum, then those guys don't qualify. Although day's getting closer, I think. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Let let's put it at the hundred day, uh, hundred uh, game minimum because the, the the two close the two closest coaches have been coaching for a long time. Like oh. this is a top three sort of question. Okay, if if we're going over a hundred games, I'm going to say yes. He has the best winning percentage. Uh, and he does barely. Can you tell me who's second on that list? Okay. Um, I got to think here. Uh, so is this power five or all call or all division one? Power five. Power five. Power five. Um, I mean, we're not talking like Brian Kelly here, are we? We are not talking Brian Kelly. Um, Sark's not going to be at a, I mean, is, is Kirby smart at a hundred games? Um, he, he may be, but he's not up there in terms of like a ton of games coached with okay. uh, a certain winning percentage. Okay. Um, let's see here. Power five. Who's going to be close. That's a tough one. Who, who's second there? Dabo Sweeney is the oh, close God. second there to, uh, to yeah. Nick Saban. Yeah. I'm so, a little um, surprised Dabo because he, he started off a little rough and he's had a, He's, he took some losses the last few years. He had a real good stretch in the middle, though. Yeah, Saban's winning percentage was 806, and I believe Dabo is somewhere like in the 797 mm -hmm. range. So so they're pretty they're pretty neck and neck with one another. Okay, is Nick Saban the last SEC coach to win AP Coach of the Year? Oh, um, let me think. I'm – I'm going to say no, because Saban, I think he's one of those guys that either hasn't won it recently or is it, hasn't won it as much as you would think he has because people kind of – this usually goes to a team that like was supposed to be bad and Alabama's never supposed to be bad. Um, I'm going to say no, and I think maybe – was it Ed Orgeron? Did Ed Orgeron get – That is correct. Here? Well done, yes. Ed Orgeron. I believe that was 2018. Uh, 19. There have been 19 with the 19, national 19, yeah, when they won the national title. Um, Ed Orgeron won AP Coach of the Year. Saban has won it twice, though. Can you tell me the dates that Saban has won? And they've been – both both of them have been at Alabama. I'm going to guess 2009, which was their first national title. Is that one right? Okay, uh, in 2008, the first one actually, what was it? I don't think he won at Alabama, now that I'm thinking about the it. The 2003? I, yeah, I think it was when he was at LSU. Yeah, um, so I'm guessing 2003. 2003, yeah, that, I just found the list. Yeah, 2003. And then the first title at Alabama, which is 08. I always confuse 08 and 09, but um, okay, so the, it's the, the basically his first two titles he won it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Has uh, Nick Saban produced the most first round picks of any coach since 2000? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to take Saban there. He has, and it's it's pretty close. Can you tell me the school in second place for most first round picks since 2000? Is it LSU? No. Is it Georgia? No. Is it Clemson? No. Is it? It's not. No, Texas hasn't had that. They had a dry spell there. Um, is Ohio State? That is correct. Ohio okay. State is the close second there. Um, let's keep this thing going because I know we're winding down on time mm -hmm. in the segment. Um, Nick Saban, the oldest coach in football before he retired. Like Ooh. active. Is he the oldest active coach before he retired? So he was 71. Is there someone older than 71? I I kind of want to go – I wanted to go Ferentz here again, but I for some reason I want to say he's like late 60s, maybe 70. Who's older than Nick Saban? 70 uh, – Mac Brown is older. Uh, <laughs> you are barely right. Barely. Yeah, Mac Brown and Nick Saban are the same age. They're both 72, but Mac Brown is a month older Let's than Nick go. Saban. That is uh that's very, very fortunate. Do we have do we have time for one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Real quick. One more. Of all the coaches featured in the movie The Blind Side, was Nick Saban the coach that refused to to read the lines in the script and made them up? Uh <laughs> No, uh, he strikes me as a rule follower. I'm going to say 
I'm going with uh, I'm going to go with Phil Fulmer. Didn't want to read his lines. Nick Saban made up his line. Oh. He did not want to follow the script. He said, why am I going to just say this garbage when I know how the conversation went? Fair enough. Fair enough. That is a Nick Saban knows better line. I appreciate that. Uh, that is our little game here for uh, today on a Friday. That was fun. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm really proud it was of fun, my- like on the back end at the beginning. I probably should have had more detail on some of these for you. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just really proud of that uh, Mac Brown call. I'm I'm happy I got no, not, that. One not right. bad. Not uh, bad. Coming up next, we've got Vinny Iyer from the Sporting News. He covers the NFL. Next on Herd at Sports Radio. Wrapping up hour number two here on Herd at Sports Radio on AM 590 ESPN Omaha ESPN Tri Cities. We are getting you uh, set for our guy, Vinny Iyer from the Sporting News. He is uh, he covers NFL football, and uh, he is joining us now on the War Horse Sportsbook hotline. Vinny, can you hear us? Do we have yeah. any? It says he's in the stream, but it says audio only. <laughs> Vinny, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you guys. Oh, there we go. We've got Vinny Iyer from the Sporting News. Uh, Vinny, been a busy week here with uh, some coaching changes. Obviously, the highest profile one is Bill Belichick, uh, but we've got Pete Carroll moving on as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on how each of those played out and with the hiring of Gerard Mayo already in New England? Yeah, I mean, I knew they were going to act pretty fast in New England to just have something lined up. You just don't move on from Bill Belichick without having a little bit of a plan. And Gerard Mayo, I think, has a little bit more connection to the current players and team than, say, an outsider that has some knowledge of the Belichick system and Mike Vrabel. So it was a good, uh, quick decision here. I mean, I think they've been grooming him as a successor for a while, potentially. And the former player cycle is now more interesting right now with what Antonio Pierce did as an interim coach he might be promoted full-time to the Raiders Dan Campbell those type of uh, guys are probably going to get more kind of attention here as we go forward D'Amico Ryans of course being a great example just going from uh, being a leading linebacker to his team to leading that same team to the playoffs so I really think that's going to be a bit of a trend with some hirings going forward on top of finding those young offensive coordinators who can really turn around a team and a quarterback. Vinny, on that other opening, the big one in Seattle, where do you think they might look in terms of their next head coach? Obviously, they're um, taking a little bit more time than the Patriots did because the Patriots barely took a day. Um, but there are, are there some some logical candidates that make sense for the next Seahawks head coach? Yeah, I think Dan Quinn is the one we circle right away. I mean, you have Pete Carroll still part of the team for now. I mean, that's before he may be pursuing something else if he wants to keep coaching. But I think that was the reason is to maybe reach out to some of these guys that worked under Pete Carroll. It's a really good job. I think it's a seamless transition for Dan Quinn, having been there already as a defensive coordinator. And I think he was just waiting for the right opportunity to leave Dallas. He's done a really good job with that defense, but – Keep in mind, he's also a coach that took a team to the Super Bowl. I know Kyle Shanahan gets the credit a little bit for that 2016 MVP run with Matt Ryan and the Falcons, but Dan Quinn was the head coach. And uh, we remember 28-3, to and I think unfairly that has kind of uh, kept maybe Dan Quinn in a bad light, but he was a very successful coach when he had the opportunity, turned around a team, brought in the right guys. So I look at the Seahawks, obviously they were 9-8 and eight in the last two seasons, so there's something there where you don't need to do too much here to keep them competitive and they keep that kind of Pete Carroll mentality going. So Vinny, as we know, across the board, right, you know, you have openings for a spot for Bill Belichick. You have something opening up potentially for Pete Carroll, depending on what he wants to do. Um, and then, you know, just Brable was another name that popped up recently on the board, which was probably the most shocking to me. Some would argue Carroll. I think Brable was, was the, 
the more shocking one. Where do you see at least those guys ending up if they do stay in football? Yeah, I think the biggest thing right now for Pete Carroll, I mean, he's used to it. He's had a general manager. He's worked side by side with him, John Schneider, who's done a really good job there. But Mike Vrabel, that was the question mark, right? They made some changes. They had uh, John Robinson as the GM. They moved on from him pretty quickly here, at, even though he's had some good success. The Ryan Tannehill acquisition and some of the drafting he's done. So I think what happened there, Mike Vrabel maybe wanted too much personnel control and things that maybe the Titans weren't willing to offer. So that's going to be hard, right? I think the new trend in general, you look at some of these uh, partnerships, uh, Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell has been really successful. You look at Sean McVay and Les Snead. I think this is the kind of thing that more teams are looking for, that partnership between GM and coach that works out versus one guy calling all the shots. And I think maybe the exception is Belichick, right, because of his experience. I think uh, I look at him and – I think he has a better shot, much better shot, I think, obviously, in this cycle than either Pete Carroll or Mike Rabel to immediately get rehired. I mean, Belichick is the much bigger name, much more accomplished. Carroll, as good as those Seahawks teams have been, it's not like they've had massive breakthroughs here. They've been more of a middle-of-the-road team here. So I look at the commanders, and I think they're going to do everything they can to get Bill Belichick because they also need a director of football operations. I think teams will be a lot more comfortable giving Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick the entire power versus Brable or Carroll. We're talking with Vinny Iyer of the Sporting News. Vinny, with that said, if you were a team, would you have any concern about giving Belichick personnel control considering the way it's gone recently? That's probably the area that you would point to as the bigger problem for Belichick than the actual coaching. Is that something you'd be comfortable doing if you were an NFL team looking to hire Bill Belichick? What I would do with Bill Belichick, obviously he knows how to coach defense. And I think you would say, okay, we're going to get you the defensive players you want and the commanders. That was the big issue this year. He's going to automatically, if he has an influence on that team, make it better just by the way he schemes even with that same talent that struggled for Jack Del Rio and Ron Rivera. So that's one thing to look at. And then the other is this uh, commanders are in great spot. They have the number two overall pick. They've got nine draft picks. So I think it just depends on the situation. I think in that particular situation, you'd feel more comfortable giving them control because it would be a big change and an upgrade from what you had. But if you're looking for other situations, uh, maybe you're in Atlanta where you have uh, – an established GM there in Terry Fontenot, who's done a pretty good job getting some players in. I don't think he would be a good fit for that situation. But then the Chargers, you look at them, they're looking for a GM as well as their coach. So I think that's the kind of environment that we're going to have to look at for Bill Belichick because it's hard for all that he's accomplished to take anything less than that combined role. Vinny, is Jim Harbaugh on the move to the NFL? You mentioned the Chargers, and that's been the number one spot he's been connected with. If you were making a prediction, is he staying at Michigan because he just won a title there and because he's beloved there, or is he coming back to the NFL? Well, I think right now it's about 50-50, but I think the NFL might be pulling him because this is a, also a unique situation. There's not many coaches that have been able to win titles in college and in the NFL. And Jim Harbaugh was a few moments away from winning a Super Bowl as well and to join that exclusive club, who includes Pete Carroll, who I mentioned before. So that's a challenge, right? I think it's kind of a family that takes coaching challenges personally. You look at his father, longtime coach, and, and doing well in the FCS level. You look at his brother, obviously, there with the Ravens, doing a great job for many years and uh, rose from a special teams coach. So I think they just pride themselves on coaching challenges. And I think the Chargers are a reasonable challenge because you're trying to catch Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. But then again, you step right into a situation where you have Justin Herbert, a quarterback that can get you there. And you don't have to worry about that. Where all these other situations, Atlanta, Washington, Carolina, even with a drafted quarterback, Tennessee, you got to worry about the quarterback and worry about if he's going to come through. With Herbert and the Chargers, you know you have that going for you immediately. 
Vinny, just a couple minutes left here. I wanted to get to a little bit of NFL playoff talk since the wild card weekend is coming up starting tomorrow. Which of these matchups in the wild card weekend are you most intrigued by? Yeah, I, I think when you look at the games, it's actually the last game on the schedule. It's the Eagles Buccaneers because mm. the Eagles have been under a lot of pressure and we know they're banged up and they're battling a lot of injury adversity. We'll see if AJ Brown can suit up. It looks like they'll be slightly healthier, but their defense, especially in the secondary, has been decimated. So I don't know. They're coming limping in. I think this is going to tell a lot about the Eagles here. They could just fade away and the Buccaneers take them out, or they win this, build some more confidence. We, we see what the Eagles are about. But I think this is the sneaky best game. I know there's some marquee with the Packers-Cowboys. There's a lot of revenge narratives, especially with uh, Browns-Texans and Rams-Lions. But when you look at this game, Eagles-Buccaneers, I think it's the best kind of referendum game where are the Bucks capable of doing more than this they just want a weak division but you know they have a lot of talent and you know where they've been in the past few years with a different quarterback so Eagles Bucks is most intriguing I think it's flying under the radar a little bit being the final game and being isolated on Monday then he got about 30 seconds here a uh, quick one you mentioned uh you know sneaky teams there who's your sleeper team to go the distance yeah, I think you have to circle the Rams. I mean, they've been there just a couple of years ago, so that gives you some evidence. Their, their defense nearly not as good as that, but they have a lot of youth around Aaron Donald that has played really well up front in the secondary everywhere. They've really drafted well for a team that kind of just pushed on draft picks and didn't need them. So we'll watch the Rams. I mean, if they can beat the Lions, they'll have some momentum. I think if you're looking for a team in the AFC, it's hard to – Call them sleeper, but who say the Chiefs is the number three mm. seed? I just would not sleep on them until Patrick Mahomes is out of the playoffs. You will not rest easy if you're the higher seeds. Vinny Iyer from the Sporting News. Vinny, thanks so much for joining us. We'll catch up with you again soon. All right. Thank you, guys. That's Vinny Iyer. He covers the NFL for the Sporting News. Coming up next, we will have hour number three of Herdat Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. Kicking off hour number three here on Herd at Sports Radio on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities, and hour number three on KFOR in Lincoln. Joining us now on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is our guy Mike Sodder of Herd at Sports. Mike, how are you this morning? I'm good. I don't think I'm Vinny Iyer or on the. Is Vinny still on the phone? I don't know. Um, he is not still on the phone, but. Uh... You're go. you're a close second to Vinny Iyer, apparently. <laughs> you guys got the same haircut. It's not fair. Um, <laughs> yeah. The haircut thing, you know, you can't do anything about. Well, I mean, I could, but why? Like, I'm doing like I don't, you're not you're not trying to go get the uh, not trying to get the hair plugs or anything. Not worth it. Yeah, we're good on like, <laughs> that. like the people that really. I don't know. You know, there are people that are follically challenged like me that actually spend the money to get, you know, stuff done. And I'm like, just just rip it off. Who cares? <laughs> I care. <laughs> I told I've told people all along, like, I've you know, I've got the man bun or whatever. But I was like, you know, the hairline's starting to recede a little bit. I'm aware. Like, but I, once it goes, like, or if I get like a bald spot or something, like, I'm just taking it all. Like, I used to shave my head all the time. I don't think, I think it's a good look, especially when you got the beard, like we got solder. It's a good look. Yeah. yeah I just take, I mean, I, I, when I tell people this, they're shocked at, I big razor it every day, every other day. That's crazy. I heard they do that to my face. I don't, I definitely <laughs> don't do that to my face. Um, but I, I just, yeah, just. Solder, I got to say, though, I got to say, you are like somebody that looks good bald. Like, I can't imagine me without hair. Like, I just can't, I can't imagine me looking good without hair. I said that when I was, you know, about 20 years ago, too, when I was in <laughs> It's the beard helps a lot. It's hard to go like full <laughs> naked face. But I, know. I can't grow a beard. <laughs> like, this is the problem. So because you need to make sure you invest in the, in the hair if, if, if it starts to go. Because you look like you're 12, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. <laughs> he is at least twice that old. How do you <laughs> at least. <laughs> uh, Sauter, before we get into basketball, 
uh, oh. our senior basketball analyst here at uh, Herd yeah. Sports. That is a title that he picked out himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wanted the to add shock, <laughs> the true shock on his face when you said it. I wanted to ask you, uh, the Patriots named a head coach just 24 hours after. Who cares? What do you think of Gerard Mayo? What do you think about your division rival? Um, sure. I mean, Mayo was always going to kind of probably be the guy, I guess, sure. or Vrabel, Mayo, but, um, I mean, I think this has been something that's been in the works for a long time. And it is awesome to see what is going to happen with the New England Patriots. I am so excited <laughs> about seeing what happens with the Patriots and just how they're going to get back to relevancy. Yeah, no. Hey, welcome back to the doldrums <laughs> that you used to be before Belichick got in there. And yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, I'm a New York Jets fan. It's blurry because of my camera, but yeah, I, I the how last thing I Jets fan. What'd you say? I said, how does it feel to be a Jets fan? Feels good now. Um <laughs> now that you got the uh, Tom Deflator and Bella cheat out of the way, <laughs> we're good. All right. Well, we better uh move on to something else before Sasha kicks out of the fire I have a feeling. Um, <laughs> so, um <laughs> Let's uh, let's start with Nebraska basketball because uh, we haven't talked to you since that Purdue game. I know you were there, yeah. um, and you had a pretty cool uh, moment with Coach Rule um, about b- before his famous court storming. Uh, why, why don't you tell that story real quick? Yeah, it just I I it was halftime, and you could feel that it was gonna happen, right? Like you just it, at no point. I don't think, well, okay, I take that back. Middle of the second half, or when when Purdue made that little run at the beginning of the second half, uh, wow, I don't know what just happened with the thumbs up thing. When Purdue made the run in the middle of the second half, that was about the only time in the game that you thought, oh, crap, like they might lose this game. Um, but in the first half, even after, after that, last you know 340 run or whatever that was there was there was virtually no shot that they were going to lose that game um so i just i walked down i got my my bottle of water and soda that i always do at halftime just kind of what i do and walked in front of coach rule and i said hey i leaned into him and uh you know like quiet i go hey they're gonna they're gonna do this and are you storming the court and he's like, he said, Mike, I'm going to be the first uh, blank, blank on there when it happens. So, yeah. He wasn't the first, though. He didn't, yeah, he didn't beat out some of those students. Had, yeah, he had his kid and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, he's a little older now. He moved. His, he got there as fast as he could. Are, are, yeah. you, are, you, are you saying that kids hold you back, Mike? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> hey. I, uh, no, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> coffee mug today oh that's drinking. a cute mug and then i got it for father's day it says you know dad you rock or something <laughs> most people ago. get best dad ever you get dad you rock i'm definitely not the best dad ever um <laughs> well, i'm i'm comfortable with that uh that's okay but no uh yeah i mean it, it got a little dicey in there like i went out there right just for the for so we could have some you know video of the court storm thing mm-hmm. and um and it got at one point I was like, yeah, I got to back out of this thing. Like I, I, I was like, I'm far enough in here. I got to go. I got to, you know, get ready for the actual real work stuff to do. So, no, it was fun. I I mean, I never have been a part of or seen in a court storm, a field storm or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I've never even seen that with in person. Right. So. Um, it was kind of fun to see, I guess. And I have the box score. I should probably keep it, right? Hang it up. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, it's historic. It might be the best win in program history. It has my notes on there, too, at the bottom, though. So, like, for my when I do my final thoughts thing, I always write them on the bottom of my – I mean, I should probably keep it. 
Yeah. Now, Sauter, you you had mentioned you whispered into Coach Rule's ear, like, hey, they're going to do this. It wasn't a sweet nothing. So don't <laughs> <laughs> My question, though, is was there ever a time in that game where you started to feel like they weren't going to do it? Yeah, just when at the beginning sort of of the second half when uh, Purdue made that run uh, kind of to what it was. They, they cut it to what? 51-50. Was yeah, it. yeah. yeah. But it still just wasn't the momentum in the building was not. I will I will say this though the when Purdue cut that, the fans were just booing the refs hard, and I was I was like, yeah, this isn't what the team needs you to do right now. They need you to encourage them, and you know, boo the team and not the refs and the calls that you don't disagree with. So the vibe of the building kind of just flipped on its head, and I was a little like. Yeah, this isn't like they need they need some energy here, not the the energy kind of sucked out of it from it. But then they got it right back. So um, I, I've I've said this before about Nebraska the, earlier this year. And Rink Mast, if he's not, he's probably not their best player, but he is absolutely their most important player on the team. There's no question. Um, and tonight is very interesting when they, they play Iowa tonight, as we all know, I think. Um, so Cricky and Mast were two, you know, Valpo, Bradley guys that the Big Ten teams like Nebraska and Iowa, they both of those schools recruited both of them. So it's kind of like, I mean, Mast took a visit to Iowa. So like, and I, from my understanding, uh, Iowa chose uh, not rink mass. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Iowa chose poorly is what you're telling yeah, me. I didn't say that. That will be real interesting because, you know, just watching Iowa and him, obviously we saw them, uh, saw how much success he had against Creighton. And it was mid post and elbow, you know, hidden from the pin and stuff like that. So like, is he capable? My thought is, is he capable of making a pass good enough to the front of the rim from the high post or the elbow or free throw line extended type stuff that instead of hitting that shot, because what they will do is I mean, rink can guard him out there. No problem. Um, Josiah can guard him. Juwan Gary can guard him. So they do the switches and he's not overly tall long. So if they, if Bryce Williams gets switched on him, I don't think that's really a problem. Um, just at the high post type stuff. Cause he's definitely not blown by anybody. Um, so it's a good matchup. I think for Nebraska from a athletic standpoint, which you can't say that about most games, just athleticism. It's kind of, Pretty, I think you give a little bit of, of an advantage to Nebraska. It's just, you know, turn the page and uh, move on to the, they got they got to find a way to win this game tonight. I think you got to get one on the road, um, and it's a winnable game. The matchups are pretty good. Uh, Iowa obviously scores the daylights out of the ball. I mean, they can mm-hmm. score, um, but if Nebraska comes out with that same defensive energy that they had on. Uh, Tuesday against Purdue, they're not losing a lot of games at all. I mean, they were whew, totally opposite of Wisconsin, total opposite of, of what the effort was in Madison. So the offense has been there the last couple of games. I mean, even even in Milwaukee, in Madison, they were they were there. It was there. Sauter, you mentioned ranked mast most important to the team right now. How about um, two other guys? And I want you to choose between these two. Bigger to the team right now, Sam Hoiberg. Or CJ Wilcher? Ooh. Um, well, CJ has been shooting. Uh, CJ in the last five games, he is averaging 13 and a 13.4 and shooting 64% from the field. Also, in that five games, he is shooting 61% from three, 14 to 23. So it's you probably gotta go with him right now. Um, but Hoiberg's yeah. defense and, and his yeah. scrappiness is not something to be overlooked either. Yeah, Sam brings a different. Uh, I mean, him. Uh, those two guys off the bench complement each other, I think, pretty well. 
Uh, Sam's just defensive energy. He's like the defensive stopper, the cut stopper in the middle rounds, right? Like you bring him in to cut the, you know, to cut the head off the snake for three, four, five minutes, and then you set him back down, right? Like you just you bring him in to to be that defensive stopper and and do stuff. He was phenomenal. Had two pick sixes uh, against Purdue, so he's good. I. Uh, I would probably go, I'll probably go with Sam in this case and that answer to actually answer the question. Um, just because he, he's defensively, he's, he's a little better. Uh, we're talking with Mike Sauter. He is from Herd at Sports, just like the rest of us here, uh, covering Nebraska basketball as well as uh, everything high school, but specifically right now, uh, focusing on high school basketball. I know you are down in Lincoln last night. Mm -hmm. So you weren't able to, uh, I believe our guy Jacob was at that Miller North Gretna game, yeah. which was an incredible overtime game, but let's start with your game in Lincoln, yeah. um, Lincoln Lutheran, right? Yeah. Lincoln Lutheran. Yeah. Uh, Ashland Greenwood uh, traveled to Lincoln Lutheran for my pinnacle bank game of the week. Um, so uh, that is why I went to that game and I'd, only picked Thursday games this week. I guess that looks like it was smart. I did. It didn't do it for the snow reason, but um, anyway, yeah. Lincoln Lutheran has a difficult schedule, really difficult schedule. Wahoo, um, Norris, uh, yeah. Wahoo, Norris, Ashland. I'm missing someone else in there that they're playing. They're so uh, Lincoln Lutheran C two class C two. Uh, Ashland Greenwood is the two time state champion now. In C1, uh, Norris is Class B, Wahoo is C1 school. So they've really challenged themselves. Uh, but last night, they just they had more effort, energy. It felt like Ashland Greenwood kind of didn't want to be there um, or thought they would just roll in C2 school. We're going to just, you know, just beat them. They, they're just they weren't there for some reason. And props mm -hmm. to Lincoln Lutheran, though. That's a big win for them. They've remained number two. Uh, two, three, kind of all year in our Class C2 coaches poll that I do every Sunday night. Um, so they have a, a really good team um, and really balanced. They had four guys in double figures to win that game. So uh, Coach Bounds has done a really nice job there in a couple of years to kind of build the program to be uh, really competitive at this point. So uh, it was good. Ashton Greenwood will be fine. Like they're, mm -hmm. they won two state titles in a row for – you know, for a reason, and they're extremely well coached. It's just probably a nice little learning lesson. No one was going to go undefeated, probably. So, um, yeah, a nice probably learning lesson for them to actually be ready. And they moved the game up yesterday in time, all that stuff. So it was fine. But the Miller North game was was good. And then uh, we had uh, another guy out at uh, Pius Southeast, which Lincoln mm -hmm. Pius the 10th handed uh southeast their first loss in seven games so uh southeast had been playing really 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 well and uh and that was a rematch of the hack tournament championship so Sauter, i want to ask you about miller north here obviously i know jacob was at the miller north gretna game overtime game that uh the mustangs were able to prevail in um in that one but how do you like or I guess, how do you react to how they've bounced back after kind of getting smacked? I think it was by Central, right? And the, they got, yeah, they, kinda, they got smacked. Not right? kinda, like, yeah. Don't put the kind. <laughs> yeah, Central smacked them pretty bad. Uh, yeah, it's a super veteran team, so I knew that they were going to be fine. Like mm -hmm. they, um, and Gretna Miller North, there, no one is separated that much, right? It, mm -hmm. This is something we said at the beginning of the year in high school basketball and on the boys side especially in a there's like every team can beat everybody on any night of one of six teams seven teams i think we said now that number is maybe shrinking a little bit um uh, to maybe one two three four uh teams in that in that realm maybe five uh but you know bellevue west right now is playing the most complete they have the most complete roster um so i think that that is something that to keep an eye on just they have the two bigs but miller north was they're fine like they're not they have four four of their five starters started last year and frankly if you look at the fifth starter from last year he was probably the fifth of five of the five so 
Um, they're fine. It's just how much bench production can they get? And the guy, Grant Urbanic, has played really well for them to mm-hmm. start start the year. I guess we're now kind of the mid – I mean, it's mid middle of January, so we got a month and a half left. So we're probably past the start of the season. But um, he's played really well. Neil Mosser's ability to pass the ball. And Derek Rollins. Derek Rollins is – guy that probably i mean he i feel like he gets a lot of attention but he's still underappreciated which is pretty odd i guess um he, he's probably it's just a little undersized for you know to be a post but he has mm-hmm. to play the post in uh in nebraska but he's, he's fine miller north will be fine gretna will be fine gretna's got to find a a half of a sixth guy right like they need like just somebody else to do something for like five minutes a game to give their five senior starters a rest um and those five senior starters have obviously gone through a lot not just this year i'm saying like they've been through the wars right Mm -hmm. um so uh that i think they'll be they'll be fine Sauter, i was uh you know, last night uh, a story came across my feed. Um, you know, cause back when I worked in Sioux City, South Sioux City, uh, girls basketball was always like a huge piece of history. And so Kelly Flynn's name had they, they did one of the news stations up there did a story on him. And then, you know, I, I'm looking at the girls basketball ranking South Sioux City 10th right now in Class B. But, you know, it seems like that program could be getting, you know, I don't want to say close to where, where they were. Cause that was just insane what they did when they won 10 yeah, titles was... in 11 years. But like, what do you remember most about like Kelly Flynn's tenure? Because like when I was watching that, I'm like, all I ever got to see or, or really hear about were the stories. I never actually got to see it in person. Well, they have some of the, I mean, Robinette was one of the best players like ever probably in the, I mean, she's in the, when you talk about Mount Rushmore conversations. So um, he, the fact that he went to Fremont and won one, two, like two, three years ago is something right. Um, kind of, he's the, one of the nicest guys like ever. Uh, but they had that, they had that place rock. I think they're retiring some or doing some special for him up in South Sioux. Um, I think the word you're look, you look for is relevance. They're back mm-hmm. to like being, thank you. That's decent. A good, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. Decently relevant in class B, but right now it's uh, two teams in class B and it's only two teams and it doesn't really matter um, who else because it's Scott and Elkhorn North and girls class B, but everyone, everyone else is playing for third. Um, it's, I think that's very clear and I feel like everyone is playing for, I think Scott's still playing for second um, in that conversation, but yeah, South Sioux's good. I mean, the dome there, you ever been, if anyone. Oh, ever, yeah, the mini yeah. dome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the mini dome is interesting. It's not huge. Um, it's quite too many. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it's not an actual dome. It just has the curvature, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, it's it can get tight and loud in there. And it used to be really, really loud in there when guys like Mike Gazelle played there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was. That's fun. He had some battles uh, against teams like a Gretna and Ralston and stuff back in the day. But Kelly was is a great guy. He's super, like one of the nicest guys. But he is also not. He wasn't afraid to uh, get outside of his comfort zone a little bit. If you know what I mean by that. Mike, before we let you go here, just a couple minutes left. Um, I know that. Uh, you're a big wrestling guy as well. Are you going to be able to uh, check out the Nebraska Iowa wrestling match, not just the basketball game tonight? But yeah, I'm going. Tomorrow? I'm going. I'm going. All right, well, I think I'm going. What do you expect from Nash against kind of like leveling up the competition a little bit here? I'd be fine. <laughs> I'm I'm planning on going tonight to the Iowa Nebraska wrestling duel because I. I think I'm the only one that understands what is actually happening um, when stuff happens on a wrestling mat. So from our team of people anyway, so um, which is fine. It's good. And then I'll watch the game, the Iowa Nebraska game uh, on BTN plus or whatever it is uh, after the wrestling, but Nash, 
It's more than that. Like, I mean, we're talking like the two top five ranked teams mm-hmm. in the country in a duel, and there is the no love loss part. That's real. Um, like, really real. Uh, so, yeah, it should be fun. I, you know, weather permitting, hopefully, people can get out and kind of go watch that if you live in Lincoln or if you don't. I know people that are going to go. So, and then tomorrow, uh, I'll be at the Creighton game at noon. And then, uh, and then the Metro Conference Wrestling Tournament is tomorrow, all day uh, and night. So I'm planning on going to that if they still have it. So uh, tomorrow, yeah, night, the finals are set for 7.30 at uh, Bellevue East. That is uh, our, our busy, busy friend, Mike Sauter, all over the place this weekend. Mike, we appreciate your time. As always, we will – Catch up with you, hopefully in person next week, uh, assuming that the weather doesn't try and kill us all again. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Meh. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. See you, man. Coming up next, <laughs> War Horror Sportsbook Sports Cleanup. We've got a question we've been asking each other all week. Haven't been able to get it on the air yet. We're going to do that next year on Herd at Sports Radio. Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, as well as KFOR in Lincoln for this hour number three. I'm Ravi Lula, Andrew Rogers here with me, Sasha Durkin doing the Lord's work back at the (laughs) Herd at Sports Bar and Grill because the rest of us were too soft to brave the weather and we appreciate her immensely for getting us on the air today. Uh, It is time for, you know, our War Horse Sports Book Sports Cleanup. And usually we like catch up on stories we missed, but I want to catch up on a topic that we missed earlier this week that we've been kind of thinking about, mulling around, throwing back and forth um, a little bit. Uh, But before we get to that, I do want to remind our friends here about the War Horse Sports Book Festival of Games. Um, They... The prop card challenge can win you $100,000 for the big game, the professional football championship on February 11th. That's the day before my half birthday. No big deal. I don't expect mm. you to do anything, although it is a Monday. We'll, you know, we'll have a show. I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, uh, with the, the uh, festival of games, that $100,000 would be a nice prize for my half birthday there, but, uh, you know, yeah, if I win that, you're not getting it. <laughs> just, a little, just a little taste, you know, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do... take you to your favorite restaurant. How about that? Hey, that'll work. That'll work. You're going to my favorite restaurant this weekend. Yeah. This weekend. Um, no, the, free uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, prop card challenge. All you have to do, you gotta be a rewards member and you go and get an entry. Every time you place a $50 or more sports book ticket, at the casino in Lincoln. You got to go to Lincoln to qualify and to validate your entries, which you do just by swiping your rewards member card. But for every $50 sportsbook ticket, you get an entry into the $100,000 prop card challenge. You go 25 for 25 on those props and you win the big money. You also get entered into the $20,000 drawing. You can go 0 for 25 and still win the $20,000 drawing of cash or free slot play. That is what we're all about here with the War Horse Festival of Games. Uh, So make sure you've got until uh, February 1st to get qualified for your entries. And then the props will come out on February 5th for you to pick and try and win big. So on this War Horse Sports Cleanup, uh, before we get to that, I (laughs) I wanna shout out our friend, uh, Steven Young here in the chat. Not Steve Young, the great lefty QB from uh, from the 49ers for BYU. And lefty QBs can play football. Yeah, lefty QBs are people too, just like kickers. Um, but <laughs> Steven Young telling us that in Minot, North Dakota, it is currently negative 10 with blowing snow. So if you're feeling bad about living in, the, in Nebraska, just remember you could always live in North Dakota. Minot, North Dakota, by the way, I believe the hometown – of actor Josh Duhamel from the transfer Transformers franchise <laughs> from believe, the transfer portal. <laughs> yeah, from the transfer portal. Well, he did play quarterback, I believe, at uh, a Division two school, um, and was pretty good. So, you know, there's uh, our little sports connection there to Minot, North Dakota. You know what? It's seventy degrees where I'm at right now. So, yeah, it's uh, probably a little chillier than that. Uh, actually, it's probably like 70 in my basement. You know, I got the little heater going. But yeah, I got the fireplace the, going. I got the heater on. I'm I'm good. 
I'm good, good to go. I got a blanket go. on. Uh, no joke. I feel like I'm working in TV again where I don't have to present myself like from a certain <laughs> like half of my body up. So I am wearing PJ pants and I'm proud of it. I, you know, it's good to know a little behind the scenes there. We appreciate it. Um, but to get to our, our, our war horse sports book, sports cleanup, um, the question that we've kind of been kicking around all week as Nebraska's continued to hit in the transfer portal with positions of need and, and fill in some of the gaps on the roster is, it, it, and you brought this up to me was how fast can Nebraska get to the place that Washington got to? And that is, I took that in the sense of, and you can tell me if this is how you meant it or not. I took that in the sense of becoming a team that, I don't know if if necessarily you mean make the national championship game, but becoming a nationally relevant team in terms of the college football playoff. Now that's about to get easier with the 12 team playoff expansion, but so to me, that's how I took it. How how fast can Nebraska get to – because if you're in like the top 18 to 20, you're kind of in that conversation now, mm-hmm. right? So how fast can Nebraska get to that point where they're knocking on the door? Is that how you meant it? I actually meant it on how fast they can get to the national championship game. Okay. Um, All and right. the reason for that was, I mean, you look back at the last, um, at the last 20 teams, okay, mm-hmm. that were in the national championship game. 15 of the 20 – since the college football playoff began, we're top 10 in recruiting. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that that's a must-have, but that's a pretty high stat. It certainly helps. Certainly yeah, helps. to get to the national title game. But three of the last four were outside of the top 10. So TCU, in Washington, Washington. Twice. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's, we're just talking about, oh, well, yeah, TCU, Washington. Oh, and Clemson at one point was like 11. Okay. Um, okay. It, like with like the late teams, but still they were borderline. So maybe it's closer to half, but it, it's showing you that because of the parody that we're seeing across of college football, that you don't have to be a top ranked team in order to get somewhere. And that's where I think it leads into your point of when can they get back to national relevance so that it's easier with the 12 team playoff. And if you really take a peek at Michigan, if you take a peek at Washington, their recruiting rankings are 15 and 36 in 2024. It's not crazy. And, no. and Nebraska's not far off. No, Nebraska uh, out recruited Washington last year. I it, mean. And add in a five-star this year. Michigan doesn't have a five-star on their roster coming into uh, this class. They may have more four-stars than Nebraska, yeah. but they, they don't have a five-star. So moral of the story is you don't have to be a top-five team like Georgia, Bama, Texas, Miami, Ohio State to be competing for national championships. Sometimes it's just about development. And the good thing about Nebraska is that is number one on their priority list is to, mm-hmm. to develop guys so that they can turn out to be skill options like we saw at Washington this year so that we can possibly see Dylan Rayola be just as good as what Michael Penix was this year. It may not be next year. It may not be two years from now. But I sure as heck wouldn't put it past Nebraska to be in a position to do something pretty special in three years' time. Yeah, so you're pretty close on time frame as to what I'm thinking about because I do think Dylan Rayola is, I think within Dylan Rayola's career at Nebraska, you could be talking about, and listen, there's some things that have to go right, obviously, some development that has to go right, some some recruits that have to develop, things like that, right? You know, you're probably going to need Malachi Coleman to turn into what he you probably need him to reach his ceiling right you probably need Jalen Lloyd to continue to develop you're going to need those young defensive linemen to continue to show to develop from the promise that they showed as true freshmen right but I think they could make the 12 team playoff by 2025 so not this year but but next year Dylan Rayola's sophomore season and I, I think they have a chance to be in the 12 team playoff. I think they could, I, I would, I would actually predict that they will be ranked next year in the top 25, but so not, not all the way where they need to be, but I think they will end up ranked next year. So that's a step in the right direction. And then by 2025 with Dylan Rayola as a true sophomore, I think Nebraska has a chance to make the 12 team playoff again. Things have to go right. You have to get, you have to, you have to hit on some guys. You're going to have to 
again, we talked about how precise they've been in the portal. They're going to have to continue to do that and be targeted and hit the guys they need to. But if the things go right, because let's be clear here, TCU and Washington, although I think more so TCU, that was a real lightning in a bottle situation there, right? But you have to have the guys in place to capture that lightning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. you, I mean, Quentin Johnston was a first-round wide receiver on the outside. Max Duggan was going for the Heisman that year. Yeah. Like, sometimes just the right people do the job. Yeah, you have to have the pieces in place. You have to have the the materials there in order to catch that lightning, right? Because lightning strikes all the time. Not very many people catch it. TCU was able to catch it. I think to a lesser extent, because I don't think Washington's was as fluky, um, as TCU's was. We saw TCU take a big step back this year. Um, I don't know that we'll see, unless DeBoer leaves, I don't know that we'll see that big of a step back from Washington this year. But again, they kind of caught lightning in a bottle. They got you know the, the receivers on the same page and Penix on the same page. They got that offensive line to gel and, be, and get the Joe Moore award. Like They had a lot of things come together. I think by 2025, we could be talking about Nebraska sort of in that same breath. Wouldn't hate it. Wouldn't hate it. Hey, I wouldn't hate it either. Makes our job a hell of a lot of fun if that happens. All right, coming up next, we will close out the show and close out the week with our guy, Matt Verzal, and uh, we will send you off hopefully safely into the winter <laughs> storm here on Herd Out Sports Radio. Welcome back to Herd Out Sports Radio here on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, and KFOR in Lincoln. Uh, we appreciate you hanging with us through our uh, our impromptu double remote show here. <laughs> uh, we're, we're hit with the storm. And uh, again, for the last time, but certainly not undeserving, thank you to Sasha for uh, braving the elements to get us on the air this morning. Um, and joining us now you know, on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is our guy, Matt Verzal, former Husker, owner of Paisan's Pizzeria. Verz, how are you? Good boys, how are you? What's up, man? You look like you're all set up, ready to go today. Not inside the, the shop? No, I'm at the shop. Oh, Please. you are? So you have, a, you have a place to do this at the, at the store? Yeah, I do Husker Hangover from here every Sunday. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> so yeah, I have a full setup. I got a board. I got everything. There we yeah, go. He's got secondary. Oh no, they're not plugged in. I got cameras. I got the whole nine. Man, he's got a better setup than we do. We need to. We need to get you to to set up our stuff over here. Um, we uh, appreciate you joining us, being flexible on uh, joining on Streamyard today. Uh, Verse, I've always. I'm kind of curious because I'm sort of a weirdo, and I I don't really usually mind going out and getting some food when it's weather like this out. Do people venture out a lot to the? to the shop when when it's uh when it's kind of nasty out like this i am not expecting a whole bunch today i don't know what's gonna happen usually when i head over here from from my house i'll you know you're seeing hundreds of cars today there's about six but i don't know you just kind of the unknown like you don't know if other people have put their their workers in the office and they're gonna buy some you know so we have some other things we need to get done um I got a couple, couple, three, four that work for me that are a little crazy. So they, I texted everybody this morning. I was like, if you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. Meaning it's in your hands. I'm perfectly fine if we shut down for the morning. If we don't, you know, not a big deal. Nope. They all showed up. So they're in animals the doing their that's, thing. That, you know what? That, that's a good trio of workers. Yeah, it is. They're, they're good kids and they're, they're, they work hard. They're, probably the thing I like the most about it is they like each other. Like they like to work together and we are, we are a very locker room culture. We are, you know, there's a lot of S that gets talked and, and that kind of stuff, but I think it doesn't surprise me one bit. I think it's good for people. I, I think people are too soft now. So we run it a little bit while we're in here. And, and if your feelings get hurt, you better put them away and, and get over it. So <laughs> uh that's not, just, that's not just the boys like i got some some gals that work here that can fire they, they are not afraid to return fire so well you got you gotta love it uh vers you know um you kind of talk about that locker room atmosphere and out of the teams that we saw it play in the national championship uh this week with washington and michigan you know i, I think most people would assume 
that Michigan is more that style that you're talking about because of the physical way they play and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. Do, do you think Washington got enough credit? And obviously they got, they got beat up in that game and, and, and Michigan deserved to win there. But over the course of the season, do you think Washington got enough credit for kind of having that, I mean, th- for having that kind of toughness and, and, and strong willed attitude? Um, I think a team, a team like them, we kind of have to, as a, as group of people and athletes, like Mm -hmm. get over the, the credit thing, in my opinion. Okay. It's neat. It's neat. You got there. It's really fun and that's awesome and and cool. But if you wanted credit, then you should have won. If you wanted credit. You know, you had a great season and you can have your, you know, you can have your stuff. That's great. But people that like live, like that want to be the best and, and, and don't, and maybe that's it. Maybe we don't need validation or credit. I, I think Washington has an amazing program. I really do. But Washington learned a valuable lesson. They learned what Florida learned the year before we got them. They learned you, you can't do it your way no more. It's neat. You got a guy that can throw it and great receivers and all that stuff. When it gets to a time when, when you got three, four, eight, nine, twelve guys that want to punch you in the mouth and are going to have a good time doing it, how do you answer that bell? And, and for me, it is awesome because it reinforces the point that what worked thirty years ago works today. It's Marshawn Lynch. You want to punch him <laughs> in the mouth over and over, over, over. and and Wash and I, and I like I said, I love what they do. Wash is lucky. Sharon Moore had an offensive coordinator breakdown and wanted to show everybody how big his brain is. Mm-hmm. Cause that could have been 42, 42, mm-hmm. nothing, whatever they wanted it legit, whatever they wanted it to go down because number seven, that plays defense for Washington did not want the smoke did not want it. And then number seven for Washington on the other side, being hurt the running back that didn't help their cause, but right. not my pig, not my farm. But yeah, I, I, I get it. My second place trophies that, that I've had from high school, and then here, you know, coaching this guy, I don't know where they are. Sure. I, I just didn't, it doesn't factor to me. So, Verus, last week you mentioned high school there at the back end, and it, it just had me thinking about acclimation periods for guys and, you know, players coming out of high school to be up to speed, to play the college game. Uh, I'm curious about the status of some of those 2023 guys, uh, especially at the offensive line position, because all of them redshirted. I believe all of them redshirted and uh, they, they were able to develop last season in the program, but how far along are they actually after one season of development? Can you share some thoughts uh, and maybe some insights into the sp- specific challenges and responsibilities of development stages for offensive linemen in year one at a school? I think a lot of it is the system that you run <clears throat> at college may be a little bit more complex okay the biggest acclimation is the speed and it's when you were the bigger and a middle strong guy on your team you know you you could do a lot of things now you you have linebackers that run multiple tents faster than you could imagine running you know so you got to understand now i got to figure out angles you have defensive linemen in front of you the way as much or more and are quicker than you. So, okay, how do I do this? Do I quit or do I figure out technique that I can use every time to beat them? You know, it's really how the mental phase of it. I tell kids that I work with all the time. Physically, you're gifted enough to be there. That's why they brought you there. It is 100% a mental game now. When you break and you will break, can you recover from it? Can you adjust to getting getting your ass kicked? Can can you can you be the one that gets stumped and can you get back up? Everybody gets got. And mentally, some kids can't handle that. They they think, oh no, I'm the dude. I've never, it's never gonna happen to me. Then it happens. And the first time you get knocked down, they're like, uh oh, what's he gonna do? <laughs> so it's that phase of it. Having a year in inside of it in the way that Rule operated the program, I would say these guys are some of them are ready to go. Some are probably still a year out, but that's okay because the ones that are still a year out are at positions where they have older guys ahead of them so they can learn again. Um, with the transfer kid in from Georgia, 
I think at worst they'll get tougher because he's not afraid to throw hands <laughs> or anywhere. So that, that dog kind of person has been missing at Nebraska for a while. And when you don't have that, and maybe sometimes the boys just don't know how to do it. We got a guy that's going to come and show you how to do it. He may not be the best player around, but at least he's going to be nasty. Verz, you mentioned, you know, transfer offensive lineman that Nebraska got this week. What what are some of the challenges of specifically on the offensive line assimilating into a unit like that as a new guy, whether it's a transfer, whether it's some of these young guys trying to get playing time for the first time? Obviously, the cohesiveness of that unit is really important to the overall success. What are some of those challenges when you're coming in new like that? They probably his biggest thing is going to be, hey, I've heard that this that I've heard that this group isn't like the toughest around. So do I come in and do I alpha this whole situation and I take it over and they follow me, which is a, I think it's a good path. It's a dangerous path. But if you come in and you're respectful to the guys that have been there for a long time and you learn about it, right. And you say, Hey, what's your culture? What do you do? What do you think you're missing? If they can't answer those questions, then you probably have some issues, but if they can say, Hey, okay, great. Here's how I see myself fitting into this. And being a mature guy, you know, he's been around football for quite a while. So if you can do that, I, I that that coaching wise, player wise, hey, what do you do? Let me let me observe how you do things and then let's work together and see how much I fit into this. Verse, real quick here before we gotta get out. How much how quickly can you develop that trust on the offensive line? Because I know a lot of it is okay, do you trust that the guy next to you is going to do what he's supposed to do so that you can do what you're supposed to do? How long does that take, or is it really dependent on the group? Can't really quantify it, but you can show if you come in and just work hard. Offensive line is a room of respect. Mm -hmm. it, it's We're awesome people. We're very funny. We're very good looking, but <laughs> there it, he goes. We know, <laughs> we know what wins. And if you come in and you work or you exceed our work ethic, then, yeah, it, it's not a big deal. Burrs, we appreciate your time. We appreciate you joining us on video. You got We may have to do there. video every week. I like seeing Burrs' face. I'll say, he talks about how good-looking the offensive lineman is. We got to show the people. <laughs> most of the time on Fridays, boys, I'm throwing throwing pizza. So yeah, I'll enough. say, we can hear fair you enough. most of the time. I don't know if you're going to see that. <laughs> Burrs, we appreciate it as always. Have a good weekend, man. Yeah, boys, be good. See you, man. That's Matt Verzal, and that's the show for the week. Uh, again, thank you, Sasha, for getting us on the air and braving the elements, and thank you for all you for joining us. Hope you're safe out there, and uh, have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday on Herd Sports Radio.